Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Richard Lockhead on the new Common Agricultural Policy. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Richard Lockhead, Cabinet Secretary, 15 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I am announcing decisions on how we will implement the new Common Agricultural Policy from 2015. I will outline the key decisions on how we will implement Pillar 1 of the policy that is set to deliver £2.8 billion in direct support to our farmers and crofters between 2015 and 2020. And we are also publishing today more details of the Rural Development Programme, which is worth £1.3 billion over the same period that will be submitted to Europe. My objective is to ensure that these investments support food production, a rural economy and their spectacular environments. And the men and women who deliver these benefits must be supported and rewarded for doing so in all parts of Scotland, island, mainland, lowland, upland. And we know this support is vital. Total income from, from farming in Scotland last year was £829 million, including £583 million in farm payments. So it's vital that we get these decisions right within the rules, of course. And we now face difficult decisions on how to implement a policy that we do all want to underpin productive farming, but of course limits on how we can support uh, that in terms of how support is linked to production. And of course we have a policy largely decided on a European basis that needs to be moulded as far as possible to Scotland's diverse circumstances. So it has been a long, rocky road getting to where we are today. But it's now decision time and it's time for clarity. The new cap is far from perfect and hasn't delivered the simplification we were promised, but at least it's far better than what was originally feared. At the start of the negotiations, people thought the cap budget would be cut by around perhaps 30 per cent. That thankfully didn't materialise. And thankfully, the UK government failed to abolish or phase out direct payments on which our industry relies. But Scotland has been left at the bottom of the table in payments per hectare which is the formula used by Europe to give out the member state allocations, and we've been left with the lowest level in both pillars of the policy. And to add insult to injury, when Europe gave the UK over €200 million Euros in convergence money because of Scotland's low payments, the Westminster government spread it across the whole of the UK. And other governments got uplifts in both pillars and are now deciding how to invest those uplifts. Today I'm having to deal with budget cuts and mandatory deductions as well. And this all coincides with the biggest ever redistribution of CAP support in Scotland. Because 10 years ago, Europe committed to replacing virtually all activity-based supports with area payments. The Scottish administration at that time decided to put off the difficult choices for a later date by adopting the historic-based approach. Today, further delay is not an option. Europe moved away from activity-based support because of overproduction. But in Scotland, we have 85 per cent of our land class's less favoured area, so the risk facing us is actually the opposite. It's land abandonment and the loss of activity. The Government has worked, therefore, tirelessly with stakeholders and left no stone unturned to find the right solutions for Scotland. But I am under no illusions the package I am announcing today will not please everyone. Some farmers who were disadvantaged under the old cap will finally move towards a level playing field. Others will see their payments go down. But I have looked at every opportunity to mitigate the impact on genuine farmers. Overall, this is the best possible package I am presenting today for the CAP in Scotland for the period of 2015 to 2020. And given the major redistribution of support, the speed of transition, therefore, is vitally important. New entrants have lobbied for the Pillar 1 changes to be implemented in one step. Farmers whose payments will go down, sometimes significantly, have argued for time to adapt. I feel it's my duty to look at the impact on Scottish agriculture as a whole, and I believe that an overnight transition would pose a real risk to not just primary production, but thousands of downstream jobs as well in the livestock sector in particular. And given the level of reduction that many intensive farmers face, convergence will therefore be achieved over the 2015 to 2019 scheme years. But we have negotiated the ability to put those disadvantaged under the old cap straight onto the regional average through the National Reserve. And I accept that the National Reserve therefore needs to be substantially bigger than the standard 3% as a quid pro quo, and stakeholders, I believe, support this. Encouraging the next generation who have been frozen out the cap up to now is very, very important to me. That is why Pillar 2 support will be expanded into a new entrance package. Start-up grants will be the most generous allowed at €70,000 plus capital grants. And the Pillar 2 advisory service will include specific provision for new entrants. 
Importantly, in Pillar 1, we secured the ability to repeat the National Reserve in future years, so future new entrants are not excluded. And a big priority is to ensure that support targets active farmers, be they new entrants or be them long-established businesses. So we will make every effort to target every public pound at genuine activity, to target those who wear dirty wellies and not comfy slippers. This package does tackle slipper farming. Under the Scottish clause that we negotiated, land with no farming activity on it will get no Pillar 1 payments. I have also instructed my officials to add sporting estates whose principal activities are not farming to what is known as the negative list, whereby claimants are excluded unless they can prove they are a genuine farm business. These measures will ensure no payment on land with no farming activity, and that currently is estimated at 600,000 hectares in terms of what is included in the current cap. I will also limit entitlements to the area claimed in 2013 to prevent tenancies being manipulated in particular for unfair gain by others. At the other end of the spectrum, the challenge, of course, is how to reward the most active farms, especially in the livestock sector where production per hectare can vary so much. Moving away from historic-based payments does, of course, help, because historic payments, by definition, don't represent today's activity. There is broad consensus now in splitting Scotland into payment regions based on land quality and on targeting couple support at 8 per cent on the beef sector. And there remains broad consensus to treat better land in a single region, at around perhaps 200 to 220 euros per hectare, including greening, depending on the number of hectares declared. But there have been calls to improve the way rough grazing is dealt with to avoid overcompensation for the least active. And we do have a new weapon now in our armoury, extra couple supports. Month after month throughout the last few years, I've battled the UK government that originally wanted zero couple support before finally moving to 5%. But Europe finally agreed 13% for some countries of their budget being used for couple support, but 8% for the UK. And now following discussions with Owen Paterson, the Secretary of State in DEFRA and Commissioner Trollish in Europe, we finally secured clearance in principle to go up to 13% of the Scottish pot being used for couple schemes, putting Scotland on a level playing field. We have also had a second breakthrough on regionalisation. We have identified a way to split the rough grazing which is deliverable because it uses existing land classifications which will be fixed at the outset. So with these new flexibilities we will address the rough justice in the rough grazing. Rough grazing in the non-LFA and in the LFAS grazing categories B, C and D will be one payment region with a rate of around €35 Euros per hectare including greening and in the poorest rough grazing in LFAS category A there will be a separate region at around €10 Euros per hectare, including greening. But in this third region, I propose to introduce couple support for sheep at the equivalent of around €25 Euros per ewe. So that is now subject to agreement by the rest of the UK, and we will work with stakeholders on how to implement that scheme to minimise the burden of inspections. On land with the greatest risk of inactivity, payments and stocking levels will therefore be closely linked. One further related issue is the issue of huge individual payments. You know, the top five recipients in Scotland in the current cap receive between them, between them alone over £7.5 million. The changes set out will in any case reduce that by nearly two-thirds, or perhaps even more, if they don't meet the activity tests. But most farmers I speak to in the general public think there should be an upper limit. So partway through the transition, we will introduce a cap on basic payments at around £400,000 per year after labour costs have been deducted. For the vast majority, this will have no impact, but it is a very, very important safeguard and fixes the principle that unlimited individual payments simply can't be tolerated. So what I've just announced is a five-pronged assault on inactivity. The Scottish Clause, the Negative List, the Third Region, more couple support and capping. And the link to activity is especially important for the beef sector. Productive beef farms who are high recipients under the, the current, the old system. Their long production cycle means it's hard to change quickly, with implications for upstream and downstream businesses. But beef is the engine room of Scottish farming, worth over £2 billion to our economy. Now, the gradual transition I've laid out will help, and having fought hard for couple support, I propose to retain 8% for the pot for coupling for beef across Scotland, using 75% beef genetics for those to define the recipients. But I am changing the payment profile with double rate in the first 10 calves uh, and then a flat rate thereafter. 
and subject to the necessary approvals, I also propose to introduce a couple payment top-up on Scotland's islands at around €65 Euros per calf, recognising the extra challenges and distance to the market our beef producers experience on Scotland's islands. Compared with today, a 100 cow beef herd will get over 50% more of couple support under these proposals. There are, however, limits to what we can do in Pillar 1, so we must look to Pillar 2. I have therefore decided to introduce in the Rural Development Programme an ambitious Beef 2020 package. My aim is to help the sector with this through the transition that lies ahead, but also to encourage transformation at the same time. So it's about transition and it's about transformation. Before deciding on the detailed shape of the package I'll deliver through Pillar 2, I'll want to digest next week's recommendations, which I'm going to receive from the, the chair of QMS, Jim McLaren, and his Beef 2020 group. However, I can confirm today that we will be making available £45 million of new money over three years for what will be a crucial and unprecedented investment in Scotland's fantastic beef sector. <clears throat> Through this unprecedented scheme, producers will be financially supported in issues such as genetics, performance generally, and reducing the carbon footprint of the industry. The beef package will be a good example of a win-win in terms of outcomes for both economics and Scotland's environment at the same time. The cap must support productive farming, but it must also protect biodiversity, reduce agriculture's carbon footprint and conserve our landscapes. In Pillar 2, despite the budget situation, I've already increased the agri-environment budget by over £10 million per year, but the new cap also is greening in Pillar 1. The challenge here was how to deliver environmental benefit without a disproportionate hit on farming operations. For the three-crop rule, we negotiated substantial improvements, but there's still an issue for specialist barley producers. So with stakeholders, we've identified an alternative approach based on winter cover that gives equally good environmental outcomes without affecting production. So that will have to be approved by Europe, and the approval procedure is not yet known, but we will put it forward. And our intention is to implement that change as soon as we can, and in 2015 if possible. I always said there, be more, there should be more in climate change in the CAP package as well, and I'm using Pillar 2 to fund carbon audits for Scotland's farms. We've also looked at options under the permanent grassland measure in Pillar 1. Subject to Commission approval, farmers covered by the permanent grassland measure will need to have a fertiliser plan. In later years, we may also ask for that to include soil analysis as well. That's a very modest, light-touch requirement, which many farmers do anyway to deliver the win-win of reduced carbon footprint and improve profitability at the same time. The final greening measure concerns ecologically focused areas. We have to decide what features to count against the 5% EFA requirement. And I want to give farmers credit for the features they already have, but there is a balance that has to be struck. Counting every tree would create a mapping nightmare for farmers and run the risk, run the risk of EU penalties. So after detailed work with stakeholders, I've decided to go as far as I can and to include as EFA the following, buffer strips, fallow, field margins, including hedges and ditches, catch and cover crops, and nitrogen fishing crops, albeit subject to management conditions to make sure we help biodiversity while allowing for crop production. We'll continue to work with stakeholders on these details, including the use of optional weighting factors and coefficients. I've also decided to strengthen the rules and buffer strips under the good condition element of cross-compliance rules. So Scotland's a really good story to tell. Our food production has got a fantastic international reputation as clean and green. But we have to stay ahead of our competitors, and I'll be bringing the industry together shortly to see how we can take that agenda forward. So I've explained how this new CAP package will impact in some particular sectors with Scottish agriculture. But in designing the package, I've balanced the impacts across farming as a whole. For example, these latest changes to improve targeting for beef and sheep have no real impact on the dairy or arable sectors who will also benefit, of course, from the five-year transition. Sectors that have been frozen out in the past, such as deer farmers, will also be eligible for the first time. And the move to area-based payments is positive for crofters and for the Highlands and Islands. And in response to the consultation exercise, I'm reinstating a separate capital grant scheme for crofters with its own budget. The wider rural development programme supports rural communities, forestry, the environment, food and drink, small businesses, and of course the £459 million LFAS budget to help maintain and underpin our more fragile communities. But however well we've put this package together, there's always the risk of unforeseen circumstances. Despite the EU's re rhetoric about simplification, this is the most complex cap ever. Under EU rules, some of the decisions I'm announcing today can be revisited each year, such as in couple support, but others can only be reviewed once or not at all, and that doesn't seem sensible. 
So therefore, I'll be calling on a mid-term cap health check of the new policy. In conclusion, it would be naive to pretend the new cap, as decided by Europe, is perfect for Scotland. And there are important details, of course, that still have to be worked up with our stakeholders. And the package requires clearances and approvals both from the UK Government and Brussels. And if we look at the new policy, no doubt with a magnifying glass, we'll find lots of anomalies. But I believe the Government has exploited the positive aspects of what's on offer and what's secured through tough negotiations, and we will minimise these anomalies, giving us the best possible package in the circumstances. So despite the constraints of the EU rules, the outrageous budget position we find ourselves in, and often turbulent market conditions, we are confident that this package reflects Scotland's priorities and lays the foundations for a successful Scottish agricultural industry for many, many years to come. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 30 minutes for the questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary were to press the request to speak button now, and I call Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. Although we are all working to very short timescales this afternoon, we have a lengthy statement accompanied by uh, some briefing papers, and we all need time to analyse the impact of these decisions. I would urge the Government to make time for a fuller debate on this announcement. We should not forget the principles of cap reform, ensuring the best use of public money to support public benefit, and reducing the environmental impact of agriculture, while also rewarding investment in delivering environmental benefit and good land stewardship. Um, Scotland chose to delay the shift from historic to area payments and I suspect the then opposition supported that and we're now at the stage where the decisions have to be made. In many ways the debate has been dominated by those who currently receive support and what the impact is on them but this is about change not the status quo and I will support measures which aim to achieve that. Um, I welcome the measures to tackle slipper farming. I'm also pleased that supporting estates have been moved to the negative list, as well as the decision to limit entitlements to 2013. Um, the set decisions were always going to be challenging, and I appreciate how difficult it is to get the balance right, but the Cabinet Secretary recognised there were calls for a quicker transaction, um, and there are concerns that 2019 is at the top end of a transaction period. Um, even taking into account the new entrance measures, I'm sure there will be some who are disappointed by not having a shorter timescale. Can I ask what the level of the National Reserve will be and if he is confident the demand can be met from that. Um, I also have some concerns around the Pillar 2 support. The statement is very focused on agriculture. However, yesterday's emissions state statistics showed a real need for an environmental focus in Pillar 2. Pillar 2 is also vital to support rural communities in the broadest sense. When I argued for a higher transfer between Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, I said a lot of that money was going back to farmers, and today's statement has emphasised that. What does this mean for other demands on Pillar 2, which the Cabinet Secretary himself addressed, um, such as forestry, food and drink and the environment? Um, and also, sorry, just briefly, um, the, I understand the new measures for the beef sector are also about supporting transition, but is there a timescale attached to these measures and will the 45 million come out of the Pillar 2 resources? And finally, the cap on payments is welcome at a level of 400,000 after labour costs. That's pretty generous. Can the Cabinet Secretary say a bit more about why he decided on that level? <coughs> Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you to Claire Baker for uh, her questions and the way she's posed them. She raised a number of issues. Firstly, there is the big issue of the, the pace of transition. And as uh, Claire Baker can imagine, uh, my shoes are not very popular just now because everyone's been telling me they don't want to stand in them uh, because I've had some tough decisions to take over issues such as the pace of transition. Uh, new entrants, many new entrants have wanted an overnight transition, but given the, the shockwaves that could potentially be sent throughout the whole of our livestock sector in Scotland and the downstream industries as well by an overnight transition where many intensive livestock farms have faced substantial reductions overnight, I chose to use the duration of the next cap for the transition in the knowledge that new entrants will be from day one put onto your regional average in terms of their basic payments. In terms of the couple support and other payments, they'll be in exactly the same level playing field with other farmers in Scotland from day one uh, as well. Uh, Claire Baker's right, we have to look at the National Reserve in terms of how many new entrants would be included in that and how far back we go to define new entrants. 
3% is the figure at the moment, but I have just said in my statement that we will have to substantially increase that as a quid pro quo. If there's going to be a slower transition for the rest of the industry, we want to maximise the benefits for new entrants through maximising the National Reserve. We don't quite know where that figure will take us, but I have got agreement from senior stakeholders, and it's certainly the government's view that we'll increase from 3% substantially to, to cater for that point. In terms of, of the, the environment, I, I should point out, given that Claire Baker mentioned the beef scheme in Pillar 2, that firstly, that is new money for the beef scheme in Pillar 2. It will be for over three years, so it's £15 million a year for the first three years of the, the new policy, and that will have an environmental dimension to it as well. Over and above that, within Pillar 2, we are putting extra resource in for agri-environment schemes, which were announced as part of the consultation process, so I have already announced that, uh, and also extra resource, substantial resource for rest restoring peatlands in Scotland, which is a very important measure, and we had previously announced that as well in terms of additional resource uh, compared to the previous rural development programme. So I am confident that not only are we going to have a fairer policy in Scotland, not only are we going to target activity and productivity, it's also going to be a greener policy, not just because of measures taken by Brussels, but also because of measures decided here in Scotland and the budget decisions we've taken in Pillar 2. And the final point was about the level of capping. Um, as I explained, I think it's a key principle we should build into the new policy, which is there is a cap beyond which basic payments should not go. Clearly, as we go through the transition from historic payments to area payments over the next five years, those with the largest amounts of land will gain the most, and therefore we should cap where that should go. Uh, as I have said, it will not immediately impact on many farmers in Scotland, uh, especially uh, in terms of where it, the payments for activity lie, uh, but there are other measures in the cap that are mandatory in terms of the 5% of regressivity, as it is known in European language, where automatically big payments will have a 5% cut in any case notwithstanding the cap that Scotland will put in place for our payments. So for that reason, I think it's a fairer policy overall. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced copy of his statement? I think its contents will probably stop Jim Walker calling for Mr Lockhead's head on a plate, although I think that Brian Pack may now be going to take up that call. <laughs> Um, can I just briefly begin by correcting some of the comment that the Cabinet Secretary has made in relation to the role of both the UK Government and previous administrations in all of this? Of course, I have said it hundreds of times before, we would all have liked to have had the full convergence uplift, but I just want to put that in its true context, because if we had received it, it would have amounted to a 4.1% increase in the total amount of cap support. Now, that would have been welcome, but it would never have solved all of the problems that the Cabinet Secretary has faced. On the extra coupling issue, I reject any notion that the UK government was reticent in bringing this forward. Indeed, I would argue strongly that it fought for it in Europe and has delivered it. And lastly, the decision of the previous administration to stick with historic payments that has been so disparaged within this statement was unanimously backed within this chamber and if I recall rightly just in, as enthusiastically by the cabinet secretary as everyone else so I think there's a degree of crocodile tears on that one. The cabinet secretary has announced several measures involving new money quite substantial amounts of it can I ask where that money is to come from if the transition is to be gradual shouldn't the introduction of capping follow the same model and lastly, the fact is that vast amounts of money are going to be taken out of the most productive areas of Scotland, particularly in the beef sector. Would he ensure that other Cabinet colleagues do everything they can within their portfolios to help mitigate, mitigate against the serious economic impact of that as these measures begin to bite? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Thank you. I, I just remind Alec Ferguson that I have actually been negotiating with the UK team for the last few years and have been there witnessing the UK ministers seeking the phasing out of all Pillar 1 over the course of this current policy, which would have left our farmers in Scotland with zero Pillar 1 support by 2019, as opposed to the nearly half billion pounds we're discussing today. And in terms of the convergence uplift, I think there's a very important principle there in that the money was given to the UK because of Scotland's low payments, irrespective of whether it was one pound or the £190 million that did concern, the principle is that was Scotland's money and it should have come to Scotland's farmers. Uh, in terms of uh, Alec Ferguson's reference to my disparaging comments about decisions back in 2003-2005, I was simply making the point that it's very difficult to implement an area-based system in Scottish circumstances. And therefore, that was a very difficult decision to take back then, and for understandable reasons, because there was an, an option of not to do that, the decision was taken not to go down the area payments. But today, and we did support that position back then, I'm not arguing with that, I'm simply saying that it was because it was so difficult to implement an area-based scheme in Scotland, given our circumstances, 
and there was an alternative available, that is why a decision was taken. But today, we have no option. We have to go down the road to area payments. In terms of the economic impact in the most productive areas of Scotland, I have tried to lay out in the most reasonable terms in my opening statement how we have gone to great lengths and great expense indeed in terms of the Pillar 2 uh, injection to try and mitigate as far as possible with the tools we have available the impact on our li most intensive livestock farms who play such a crucial role in producing food for our tables. Of course, it is not a uniform situation. Some recipients had perhaps de-stocked over the last few years and therefore should not be getting the same payments. But other farmers, of course, are still intensive farmers and deserve appropriate support for their activity. Thank you. I recognise this is a, a very important statement and it is also very complex, but I have a large number of members who wish to ask a question. So, if at all possible, I would like the question brief and the answer brief too. Um, Rob Gibson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the reference year as decided to be 2013 as opposed to 2015 to prevent tenancies being manipulated for unfair gain by landlords. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the overall measures to encourage active farming and crofting despite the UK brokered rock bottom settlement that cannot be unaffected by the UK's rebate that bedevils a fair settlement for Scottish farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Rob Gibson says, because we have such an unfair budget in terms of Scotland's overall share of the CAP budget, it's really, really important we're as smart as possible with the resources we do have available in Scotland to support food production and environmental protection. And that's why we have put the five pronged assault into place on inactivity in Scotland so that we direct what funds we do have available towards active farming. And that applies to both the crofting counties and the rest of agriculture in this country. And I think that's the right thing to do and it's supported by the people of Scotland, every public pound, to support genuine farmers. Claudia Beamish, followed by Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary confident that the whole new cap takes into account robustly enough biodiversity, climate change and water quality for the public good? Yesterday, my colleague Cara Hilton expressed concern to the Minister Paul Wheelhouse about the 11.2% greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. While I welcome the, carbon, uh, the farm carbon audit in Pillar 2, can the Cabinet Secretary give more detail about how agricultural emissions will be tackled and whether regulation might be needed in this context? Cabinet Secretary. Okay, well, briefly, I, I can just say it's a very important issue, and I did lay out in my statement some action we're taking in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of Scottish agriculture, which is a win-win because we save a huge amount of money on farm for each farming business who takes uh, appropriate action. There are around 10 green gains in the policy we're announcing today. Many of them relate to reducing carbon footprint. So I think Scotland today sent a very clear message. We're a clean, green country. And in terms of the international marketplace, our food is going to be produced more sustainably than ever before, and certainly more sustainably than many other areas of Europe and the world. Tavi Scott, followed by Agnes MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of his statement and also thank him for the courteous discussions he has had on a cross party basis on this uh, CAP uh, regime? Can I give a broad welcome from, for the transition support for the payment regions and for the island cattle payment, which will be particularly important for Orkney, uh, if I may say so? The Cabinet Secretary will share my concern over the decline in cattle and sheep numbers, beef cattle down by 13%, sheep, breeding sheep by 17% since 2004. Does he believe that the measure he's announced today will reverse that decline and does the complexity of the new cap he's announced today and indeed uh, offered his concerns about today uh, mean more on sheep support mean more farm inspections sheep counted and other cross compliance measures and is he able on the payment regions to state what the definitions are for the LFA grazing categories A, B, C and D which would be of course a help now uh, to farmers and crofters trying to work out what these measures mean thank you cabinet secretary uh, thank you. Clearly, a, a key objective of the policy announcement today is to support livestock production in Scotland, in particular, given that the new system of area payments uh, has a huge impact on intensive farming in this country, uh, be that in, in Shetland or Orkney or, or anywhere else uh, in the country. Therefore, I, I'm, I think it's the right thing to do to support livestock production in terms of cattle and sheep uh, in particular. In terms of the complexity, uh, as I said, because we're tailoring a European policy to Scottish circumstances, that brings some complexity with it. We were very careful about the third region option to ensure that it is implementable, otherwise it would backfire. And that was concerns expressed by Brian Pack, as referred to by Alec Ferguson. And that's why we're using these fixed 
grazing categories under the LFAS classifications to deliver the third region scheme. Uh, and in terms of inspections and bureaucratic burden, we will work very closely with stakeholders to ensure acting within the rules, but making sure that bureaucracy is proportionate. Angus MacDonald, followed by David Stewart. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's confirmation that there will be a sheep coupled support scheme uh, following extensive negotiation on the issue with the UK Government. Uh, despite the mixed signals coming from the sheep sector on coupling, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that when the voluntary coupled support will be uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the voluntary coupled support will be reviewed in 2016-17? And can he also confirm that the eligib eligibility condition for coupled support will require that farmers will have to identify and register animals as per the requirements of regulation through the sheep EID scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, firstly, there are of course mixed views within the sheep sector in terms of the coupled schemes. Because the driving thrust of our policy is to target activity and genuine farming, and we have limited tools available, one of which is the couple support, uh, I've taken the decision that it's the right thing to do is to utilise that. But it is being utilised in a limited fashion in terms of one of the three payment regions. Therefore, not all sheep producers in Scotland will be part of the sheep couple scheme. It will only be those uh, in certain categories of land. Therefore, it will be a modest scheme for those uh, people who happen to be in those parts of the country. So many sheep farmers will not be part of the sheep scheme. And in terms of the bureaucracy, I've already indicated we'll try and keep that to a minimum, but we have to act within the rules. Uh, many sheep farmers I've spoken to have said that's a price worth paying and we should have the couple scheme because it's available to us to use. And in terms of how the, it interacts with sheep EID schemes, the Chief Agricultural Officer is going to work very closely uh, with the sheep sector and understand how we can implement the regulations in a proportionate way. David Stewart, followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that the CAP regulations allow a one-off mid-term opportunity to review the flexibility between pillars. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary undertake over the course of the new SRDP to assess and review the outcomes delivered by Pillar 2 spending, particularly in relationship to rural community development? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I should have said in response to the last question as well, and I'll also repeat it and, or, or reiterate it to, to this question. Is in terms of what reviews are available, we will utilise them to the full, be that for Pillar 2, the Rural Development Programme, or be that for the sheep couple schemes, which was the, the previous question as well I forgot to answer. Uh, we have the opportunity to review the couple schemes once a year. Other parts of the new arrangements either can't be reviewed or can be reviewed perhaps mid-term if we get the agreement of the European Commission. So I will certainly take up that opportunity with the Rural Development Programme in particular. Graham Day, followed by Eileen McLeod. Uh, thank you. Uh, like Claudia Beamish, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that he's to bring in and fund a, a carbon audit scheme for all farms, uh, as called for by the Rural Affairs uh, Committee. But can I ask him how quickly this will come into operation? how he expects or hopes it might influence on-farm behaviour and whether in years to come the charting of carbon footprint reduction or otherwise might have a bearing on financial support levels if this move doesn't have the desired effect. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. I really feel that our Farming for a Better Climate initiative is very successful and that's where we have a number of farmers participating to reduce their carbon footprint and what they have found is they make significant savings on-farm from less energy use, fertiliser use or whatever options they choose. I think it's in the interest of Scottish agriculture we roll that out and that's why I'm keen to fund carbon audits in the hope that over the next five years all farms participate because then it's a win-win situation and I'm very, very keen to support that. It's also very, very important for the international marketplace that we are seen just as green as our competitors, if not greener and more sustainable. That's in the interest of Scotland in terms of our climate change uh, targets uh, as well as the, the bottom line for farming business in this country and I'll be pursuing that with vigour. Eileen McLeod, followed by Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Dumfries and Galloway has 20% of the national beef herd and is of particular importance to the region. So can the Cabinet Secretary offer further detail on how Pillar 2 will support improving the efficiency and sustainability of the sector, particularly in Dumfries and Galloway? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. And I think Dumfries and Galloway hopefully gain from some of the measures we've decided to adopt uh, since the consultation uh, document was published. Uh, in terms of the importance of the Dumfries and Galloway to the beef sector, and indeed the dairy sector, of course, it's extremely important. Uh, and that's why we have put such a substantial resource into Pillar 2 for the beef improvement package. 
and I would anticipate that the Fees and Galloway, South West Scotland, as well as North East Scotland, many of the big beef areas of Scotland will benefit significantly from what is a £45 million investment in the future of Scotland's beef industry. Jimmy McGregor, followed by Rod Campbell. Uh, thank you. Um, the rock bottom payment of only £10, ten euros per hectare for LFAS category A land is simply not enough, Minister. Coupled with the U headage payment, it is still going to be met with disappointment by those who saw this as an opportunity to regenerate hill sheep farming. It's simply too low, and the Can fears are that... a question, that please, inspect... Mr McGregor? Sorry? A question? Yes. Will the Minister make sure he deals with the National Sheep Association to ensure the bureaucracy associated with the U scheme is minimised, given fears of a flood of inspections and extra cross-compliance measures. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will work closely with the National Sheep Association and other stakeholders to make sure we can do all we can within the law to minimise bureaucracy. Uh, I should say, of course, that Jamie McGregor is completely missing the point over the payment rates in the third region. Uh, we want to reward activity. That's why the basic area payment is as low as possible in the more rough, rough grazing of Scotland, and then the cheap couple scheme adds in the activity payment. If the outcome, for instance, was €35 Euros per hectare, with the sheep scheme added to the €10 Euro payment, that would be the same as the better land in Scotland in terms of the other rough grazing region. So Region 2 and Region 3 are both aimed at supporting activity and giving the right payment to the right parts uh, of Scotland. The only people that will lose out from what I'm proposing are large landowners who are inactive. I don't know which side Jamie McGregor's on, but I think most people in Parliament would support that we're doing the right thing with this policy. Okay. <laughs> Roderick Campbell, followed by Aline Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary offer further information on how the Government will ensure new entrants and prospective new entrants will be made aware of the support on offer, and what impact does the Government think these measures will have? Cabinet Secretary. Well, <clears throat> I care very deeply, and I hope that's come across over the last few years, about get, attracting new blood into agriculture in Scotland. And it's not always the easiest thing to support because of the world in which we live and the regulations we have to cope with. But I, I genuinely believe that when our new entrants, who I understand for very proper reasons we're looking for an overnight transition, when they see what support is available for new entrants, what they will receive from day one under the new regime that I've outlined today, as well as other support that's available through uh, the Rural Development Programme. Uh, hopefully, they'll take comfort that there's a huge step forward for new entrants in Scotland from announcements the Scottish Government have made today, and we'll continue to work closely with them in the years ahead. We need lifeblood, we need a new generation to produce food for our tables and have the skills in this country to make sure we can do that. Eileen Murray, followed by Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I note from the supporting analysis that Dumfries and Galloway will lose £18 million per annum by 2019 rather than the £22 million we anticipated. So that, I suppose, is of some comfort. Nevertheless, the transition arrangements will be important to our region in enabling farmers and the businesses dependent on them to adapt. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the arrangements for, uh, for the transition period, for example, will reductions be equally spaced over the period of transition or will they have a different sort of profile? Because I think knowledge of the profile will be important in terms of businesses actually uh, planning to adapt over that period. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, in, in terms of the, the impacts on Elaine Murray's constituency in the wider region in which she's based, uh, clearly there's only so much we can do to mitigate the impact on large historic payments moving to area payments. But as the figures outlined by Lane Murray illustrate, we have at least mitigated, as far as we can, uh, the, the decline of funds for that part of Scotland. Uh, in terms of how the transition will be managed, well, clearly there will be a, a formula that manages going from historic to area over the subsequent five years. It's very difficult to predict anyone's payment because every single farm business in Scotland is so diverse and so different. Uh, and you know, clearly each farmer will be looking at today's announcement and working out what it means for them. We will make as much guidance available as possible in as clear language as possible to help people understand the impact on their own businesses in the weeks and months ahead. Dave Thompson and finally Alison Johnson. Yes, I welcome the statement from the Cabinet Secretary and I'm pleased that the capital grant scheme uh, is being maintained. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can give us an indication of whether the, the budget for that scheme is going to be maintained at previous levels or even increased, possibly. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'll have the, 
All figures in relation to the Rural Development Programme uh, should be made available to MSPs this afternoon if you have not received them already. And, uh, Dave Thompson will find that we have protected the budget for the capital grant schemes for crofters uh, in Scotland. And we have listened closely to the representations we had about ensuring that we had a separate fund and it was not confused with the smallholders uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, overall, I think it is a very good deal for Scotland's crofters. Uh, and our crofting communities play such a vital role in maintaining our environment and producing food as well. And of course, what we've announced today will help target support towards active crofters in particular and island crofters in even more particular. So it's a win win for many crofters in Scotland. Before I call Alison Johnson, can I ask if Jean Archer actually wants to ask a question? Because your name's appearing and disappearing from my screen. Just nod if you do want a question. It has been answered. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary what formula was used to arrive at a cap of £400,000 per year, uh, notably higher than the £254,000 voted for by MEPs. How many farms this cap will affect and how much money this enables to be distributed among smaller and less well-off farmers? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> um, as I indicated in my statement, there are already mandatory measures about reducing payments over a certain level by 5 per cent. That is happening to all payments. In terms of the cap I announced today, it is an overall cap for basic payments, and I have said €500,000. Clearly, the thrust of our announcements today is to reward activity. So, Firstly, looking at the experience of the current policy, those with big payments but who are inactive will be frozen out completely if they are inactive. The top 10 recipients under the new policy will be different to the top 10 recipients, for instance, under the current policy. The amounts of funds received from the public purse for the next top 10 recipients under the new policy uh, will be a fraction of what the top 10 receive at the current time under the current policy. That is a huge step forward for fairness. We picked the cap in terms of having a safeguard in place for the transition over the next five years. As we move from historic to area, clearly those with the biggest amounts of land in Scotland where sometimes there is less link to activity, they will not be able to go beyond that cap. But the cap itself, of course, if they qualify for that, they have still got to be active farmers. Uh, and we will keep that uh, under review, of course, but there, that will come into play halfway through the transition period. We have got a late bid for a question. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And declaring an interest as a farmer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the real losers in his proposals will be those in payment region 2, in improved hill and upland areas, but still classified in under, as B, C and D areas in the Alpha scheme? Well, <coughs> these are difficult choices where to draw the line between what is in each of the three payment regions. Clearly, the, the better lands in region 1, but the region 2 the, and 3, the split of the rough grazing area, is clearly a complex and difficult decision to take. That is why we worked very, very closely with stakeholders on this issue. And many of the stakeholders, not by any means all of them, but many stakeholders were absolutely adamant we had to split the rough grazing into two regions so we don't overcompensate the less active in the region that's going to have the couple sheep scheme. Uh, so because the wider policy is geared towards activity, I hope we've got the balance right across all three payment regions in Scotland. And of course, had we had a better budget from Mr Scott's Conservative colleagues in the UK government, they'd have even bigger payments coming over the next five years, but unfortunately we are left with the worst Pillar 1 budget in the whole of Europe, and therefore we have missed the opportunity to increase those payments that the member thinks are going to be difficult, as opposed to having to reduce some of them. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Cabinet Secretary on the new Common Agricultural Policy. We are now moving to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10262, in the name of Derek Mackay and local government elections, delivering improvements in participation and administration. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. I will give a few moments for um, members and ministers to change places. Right, I now call on Derek Mackay to speak to move the motion. Minister, you have 10 minutes. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to speak to the motion in my name on the subject of Scotland's electoral future. 
While the business of voting and elections is a subject of keen interest to everyone in this chamber, unfortunately too many of our citizens do not share our enthusiasm. Only last month, turnout in Scotland for the elections to the European Parliament was just 33.5 per cent. And this disappointing level of participation will not have surprised anyone. It might even have exceeded some people's expectations, rather depressingly. In recent decades, the general trend has been towards a decline in voting at all elections across the UK. Turnout at the 2012 Scottish local government elections was just 39 per cent although this was significantly better than the 31% south of the border. In the 2011 Scottish Parliament elections, turnout was around 50%. Although this figure appears encouraging by comparison, it still means that half of those who were registered to vote didn't feel inclined to do so. Presiding officer, this has to be a matter of concern to every one of us here. While voter apathy may be seen as embarrassing for professional politicians like ourselves, in fact, it is more serious uh, than that. Last month saw the election to the European Parliament. Uh, a great deal has been said about the results of the election, and in particular the fact that Scotland has elected a UKIP MEP. While there has been some party political debate about who is responsible for allowing UKIP to gain a foothold in Scotland, however temporarily, one issue which may well have been a factor and which has even wider significance is that far too many of our citizens did not feel sufficiently engaged enough to vote for any party. What this means is that the 67% of Scotland's registered voters who were not inclined to vote in the European elections missed the opportunity to influence who would represent them and make decisions that will affect them and their families over the next five years. These turnout figures seem at odds with the fact that the public, as we know, are keenly interested in how the nation's affairs are run. From our regular engagement with constituents, we all know that people of Scotland care passionately about issues which affect their daily lives. They feel strongly about issues such as the standard of health care that they receive in our hospitals, the quality of education their children receive at school, as well as every other aspect of government policy affecting the health and well-being of themselves, their families and indeed their communities. There is no doubt in my mind that low turnout is not a reflection of the apathy of voters. Rather, these figures are an indication of the alienation felt by a large proportion of the electorate towards current political and electoral processes. The decline in voting is not restricted to Scotland, of course, or the rest of the UK is a trend recognised across all mature, all mature uh, democracies. However, this Scottish Government is not prepared to accept at the current democratic gap. And we are now taking positive steps to address the underlying causes. On the 9th of April 2014, we published the consultation document Scotland's Electoral Future, Delivering Improvements in Participation and Administration. The consultation concerns how we can improve the quality of democracy in Scotland by encouraging wider engagement and participation in elections. The document looks at both participation and also at electoral processes and procedures. Some parts of the consultation, believe it or not, are undeniably technical and look at ways of improving the electoral process. If we can improve the process and even make it uh, easier for people to vote, that might be one way of increasing the numbers of people who bother to vote. Vote counting in local government elections in Scotland is now done electronically. We readily accept this new technology and this Parliament has already recognised that the process in the last set of local elections worked fairly well. I don't think anyone would want to see the single transferable vote process carried out with a manual count uh, with the likely delays uh, that there would be. Our consultation document asks people to consider if we want to go further if uh, electronic vote counting is acceptable, might we consider whether electronic voting would also be a desirable step forward? Or if not, might we explore the potential for other innovations, such as universal postal voting, where all voters would be issued with a ballot paper by post, which they could return by post, or indeed deliver to the polling place by hand in the traditional way? The Scottish Government is seeking the views of as wide a cross-section of the nation as possible, Following the consultation closing date on the, 20, on the 11th of July, we will publish an analysis of responses in the autumn, with proposals for action following on from that. But in addition to the written consultation, we are also undertaking some direct stakeholder engagement. 
I have established a group comprising representatives from key sectors, including electoral professionals, the third sector, youth organisations and political parties. This group met for the first time on the 28th of May, and I intend to convene another meeting in the near future to consider the follow-up to the consultation. My aim is to get the perspective of a wide range of communities of interest from across Scotland and across party consensus as well. We will explore the issues which deter people from voting and consider how this can best be tackled. Ultimately, we will look to build a pathway towards greater and more meaningful democratic engagement. Presiding officer, while the range of political groups represented here today may differ on many things, I am confident that we are united in our desire for Scotland to have a more vibrant and actively engaged electorate. So in seeking to encourage debate this afternoon, I would ask members to consider the following. I know that young people have lower than average turnout rates. People from ethnic minorities are also less likely to be registered to vote than their counterparts. And research has shown a definite correlation between areas of multiple deprivation and low voter turnout. How can we engage more effectively with these particular groups? Part of the answer may lie in focusing on why so many people are disinclined to vote. Apathy derives from people's sense that their vote won't make a difference, and how can we convince them otherwise? Part of that problem would appear to lie in a certain lack in faith in political parties. And presenting officer, although we in this chamber may find it hard to believe, clearly some of our citizens are not entirely impressed by their political representatives. Some voters think that politicians and parties are all the same and are unconvinced by our ability to bring about real change. So who is responsible? Is low voter participation the fault of our electoral systems and those who administer them? Do we need to introduce new, more up-to-date methods of voting, more in tune with the 21st century? Is it the fault of our political parties? Are we not communicating directly with voters to help people understand what they are voting for and how their vote will make a difference? And there is also not a role for schools in helping to ensure that young people fully understand the democratic process. So, presiding officer, I have asked a, a number of questions in the consultation in the cross-party panel and this afternoon. And I'm looking forward to hearing the thoughts and ideas of other members as we take this work forward. I feel that this is one issue in which the Parliament can work together uh, to, to focus on that way forward. And in any event, I will conclude by reiterating that the Scottish Government is fully committed to examining all these policy and process issues, which have, of course... John Mason. I thank the Minister for giving way, and I note what he said about introducing new methods of uh, voting, but I also note in the consultation paper that it refers to multiple voting methods, and some people do actually like the traditional way of voting, of going and filling in a ballot paper. So would you uh, take that on board and accept that that is a desire of some people? Yes, yeah, I think uh, John Mason poses a, a very good question, that many people are. Uh, they, they enjoy the custom of, of going to the, the polling station and casting their their vote in the, in the traditional way. And even as we're exploring the potential of a pilot for all postal voting, that's why we propose that even in that scenario, that you can vote by post, but also potentially go to the polling station as you would normally would to cast that ballot in the traditional form. So we're very mindful of not losing those people who have uh, voted consistently and hold by the traditions that are, that are in place. And I'm also very mindful that when asked in a previous study why some people are motivated to vote, uh, the top answer actually came out as it was their duty to vote. And so that must remain a consideration in the work that we do uh, as well. So this afternoon is not intended to spark a party political debate over whose fault it is, but a way forward to try and encourage more people to vote, to engage in the democratic process, and not just from election to election but between those elections as well. And I'm sure that the debate we'll have in Parliament this afternoon uh, will stimulate that uh, dynamic discussion to help me take forward the necessary proposals to address participation in the nation's elections. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now call on Sarah Boyock to speak to and move Amendment 10262.2. Ms Boyock, up to eight minutes, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, 
I very much agree with much of what Derek Mackay said in his opening remarks, and I think that point that it is up to all of us across the Chamber to talk not just with each other, but actually to key stakeholders and, as importantly, to people who don't normally vote, I think we need to make sure that in some way their voices are part of our discussion. Because I agree it is shocking that at the last local government elections we had less than four in ten people turned out to vote. Um, that simply isn't good enough. Um, if it was just the local government elections, then we could say, let's just fix that. But we know just a few weeks ago that we had an equally low turnout for the European elections. And the reason I, I wanted to put in my amendment um, something about not just the technicalities, but the politics, was I know on the night of the elections in the Lothian count, looking at the different boxes, and we, we weren't able to look too closely at them, but it was very, very obvious that there were some areas that had incredibly low turnouts. Um, below 20% and yet there were others that were up to 50% and social class wasn't the whole explanation but it was part of that explanation. So I wanted to put that on the agenda. It's an ad amendment um, because I think it adds to the Minister's motion. We are in the middle of the consultation period by the Scottish Government so I want to focus on both the technical side in terms of the mechanics and the changes that we could make now and secondly the point that I think the Minister spent much of his time on looking about how we connect and reconnect people to the political process which I think is the bigger challenge and it's one that we all have to be involved in. I think in terms of the mechanics I'm very grateful to the work that Anne McTaggart and John Wilson did as part of the local government committee's effort in this uh, respect because I think they examined many of the clear options that are available. Um, I think looking at how we ensure that people are eligible to vote looking at how they find it easier to vote, um, looking at how we um, address the fact that far too many people are not even registered to vote. I think it might be useful to get some analysis, and I wonder if the, the Minister would be able to do that, to pull together some of the analysis behind this. There has been work done, IPPR, Electoral Reform Society, academics, um, just even dipping a toe into today's debate. There is clearly a lot of work out there. Some of it is it's UK-wide, some of it is in other countries, particularly other Western democracies where um, researchers have looked at this. But I think there are, there's a bit more work we could do just to look at some of the, the insights and the best practice that have been suggested. I think at the starting point, making it easier to register, because there are far too few people on the register who should be on the register, what more can we do there to support alternatives? Um, one suggestion that uh, Anne McTaggart and John Wilson refer to in their report is the issue about continuous registration and the experience in Northern Ireland. Um, it's been suggested by others about the idea of using day-to-day -day contact with local government or with other state institutions to have wider availability of forms, to use post offices, government offices, schools, universities, a whole range of organisations for whom it would not be uh, breaking the bureaucratic back to have a set of forms that people could fill in and hand in or if you're registering for council tax, a whole set of ways that we could potentially get people onto the register. Voting is a democratic right, it's a fundamental democratic right, but we need to do more to enable people to exercise that right. So eligibility to vote, registration on the day for those who've missed out, I was thinking about it in terms of a lot of my work locally, is with people who are homeless, people who move houses a lot. They are actually the people most likely to miss out on the regular registration points that come through the door. So. There's been some research in the US that said that significantly increased turnout. Would that be practical for us? What would be the downside? There's certainly benefits in terms of people who are the most dispossessed that would give them at least the chance to vote. Secondly, making it easier to actually cast your vote. Um, now, the, the electronic machine uh, would have massive advantages on the night where you could press the button and hey presto, suddenly we'd know what the count was. It would remove a huge amount of transparency and the capacity to double check. Um, and we would have to rely pretty much entirely on machines. I have a natural reservation about that. I don't know if it's a more a 20th century rather than a 21st century person, but I think the issue of probity and accountability and security is something that should actually be something we're all interested in, and just sheer mistakes of programme. So I have reservations about that, but I am very attracted to thinking about some of the 21st century solutions that were suggested by Electoral Reform Society. I think we should at least look at what the practicalities would be, whether it's uh, voting online, voting by phone or smartphone. Again, there are potentially um, cyber issues, and I think that was mentioned in terms of finance um, 
that's been in the news over the last 24 hours. So although we need to look at it, I think there are potentially some big challenges there. The thing that really struck me, though, in reading the report by Anne McTaggart and John Wilson was the issue of universal postal voting. Um, I was instructed by my team to get on the postal vote um, a few elections ago. They were worried I just wouldn't get around to voting on the day. And when you actually talk to people, there is a real issue about having to vote on the day and the research that's been done and the pilots have been done in England and Wales and in Scotland show that there's a really significant uplift in voting around, around the level of about 20% if people have a, the opportunity um, which is sent through their door automatically for a postal vote. As John Mason said, it wouldn't necessarily stop them handing that vote in because that feels like you really have voted. Um, but I think for a lot of people, that could be quite a game changer. It would make them aware the election was taking place. Again, there are always checks and balances, but I wonder if that's something we should look at really seriously. In the Police and Crime Commissioner elections in England and Wales, there was a four times higher turnout um, for those that were involved in universal postal voting. And in the Scottish local authorities, I've tried it, again, significantly higher. So I think in the spirit of cross-party consensus, I think we'd be prepared to look at those kind of issues and see what the, the real choices might be. Um, I don't think there are technical fixes, but I think we have to look at what could be improved in terms of practical measures that would help. Um, we owe that to people who haven't voted thus far, and we owe it to democracy to try and improve it. And even in the Scottish Parliament in, in 2003, we dropped below 50%. So there is something about making voting more easy, making people more aware about the system, but also making them want to vote. And I think that is absolutely crucial. And my amendment, in a way, focuses on what makes people want to vote. It highlights underrepresentation, particularly of young people and of people from low-income backgrounds and from areas of multiple deprivation. That's not exclusively the only groups that don't vote. I think the low registration amongst ethnic minority communities needs to be addressed, as does the, the significant under-voting uh, by students in local elections. Now, on one level, you can understand why people don't vote in terms of the disconnect, but if we think about the services provided by our local authorities, they affect absolutely everybody. And I think we really need to get that message across. Um, if we take young people, for example, what more can we do in terms of awareness? I'd be interested in looking back to the Scottish Parliament's work, outreach work over the last 15 years. There is a whole cohort we could study. Has that actually made a difference? I will not be alone at having done endless school meetings and endless meetings in this Parliament. Have we made a difference? Actually, and the issue close. about social disadvantage, I'll come back to that at more length in my closing remarks. Um, very grateful to getting the eight minutes, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name and look forward to this afternoon's debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now Colin Cameron Buchanan. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With the latest turnout and participation figures for elections to local government, it is clear that action is really needed. However, I was interested in the comments of the Electoral Reform Society in the run-up to today's debate on the government's consultation. Indeed, I agree with its central argument that a sense of this consultation is conflating two separate issues. The first is the broad, ongoing discussion about the future shape of local democracy, at the centre of which is increasing community participation and shifting decision-making decision to local level. How do we improve engagement with communities? How do we bring them to the decision-making process? Fundamental questions which I think we're all trying to answer. Accordingly, one would hope that if we're successful in this regard and are able to rejuvenate local governments and democracy, then a marker of our success would surely increase, be increased voter, voter turnout and participation. Or putting it more succinctly, this consultation should not be seen in isolation, but in part of a larger process for reform. And in this regard, I have some sympathy for Sarah Boyack's amendment, although I must say that this process of centralization did not magically appear in 2007. When we consider local government ring fencing, it is clear that the tendency to wrestle power away from local authority was as much in evidence before under the old regime as it is now. Sir. John Mason. For giving way. I wonder if we would accept too that it, it's also a question of power going down beyond local government and that sometimes local, count, local communities eh, are at a lower level than local government necessarily is. Yes, I would accept that actually. I think it, it has to go right down to the bottom. and we, we, We've had a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. Uh, I, I was also saying I think the need for discussion and debate on these broad issues, the pace of this consultation be to focus on the administration of the, on the, administration of the voting process. 
However, I happen to think there is an elephant in the room. It is surely worth considering whether the very system we use to elect our councillors has any effect, positive or negative, on turnout. It's the system, rather, I'm talking about, more broadly, or any effect on the wider participation and community engagement with the councils. I accept that this specific consultation is not the mechanism for addressing the issue, but I do think it is time to look at, the systems, at, look at the impact of the single transferable vote system on local government and their elections. Indeed, as matters stand, when we have single transferable vote, we're considering not what we're voting for, why we vote, but not how we vote. It may, it makes no sense for, me to, for us to exclude this from the general discussion on the future of local governments in Scotland. In fact, in some respects, this is actually an ideal time to consider this issue, given that we've now had two elections under STV, with one of those as a standalone, I think we should assess the impact of it, it has on participation. When the Local Government Scotland Bill was debated, its proponents told us it would strengthen democracy, increase choice and reinvigorate local government. And I have to ask whether this has actually delivered all it's meant to, or rather have we been left with a system that was simply as complicated as, as a result of compromise between two two uh, systems. I don't also think the way forward is to have compulsory voting. In Belgium and Australia, where we had it, there's a very high percentage of spot ballots, which I suppose is one way of protesting, but it serves absolutely no, pro uh, no purpose as we have here. Talking of a duty to vote, when we look at the countries who voted for the first time, time, there's always a very, very high turnout. And this is because it's their duty to vote. And I mean, I just wonder if we haven't got too many elections. How many times have we all been told on the doorstep by many people all, all over the country, politely, I've been told, go and see a taxidermist, even in deepest Renfrewshire. <laughs> and I think that's just because, it's really because people just are not focused on the, on the whole process. Coming back to the consultation, my feeling is that it seems to, serves to remove barriers to participation from the mechanics of the voting process. As I discussed earlier, there's a bigger task of getting people interested and involved. But I think, as John May says, it, it, we've actually probably got to get, go from the bottom up. We've got to get people engaged and make it as straightforward as, as possible for them to vote and also to register to vote, as Sarah, my colleague, says. I was also grateful to my colleagues, again, on the Local Government Committee, Anne and McTaggart and John Wilson, who undertook to investigate this area last year on the committee's behalf. It's not an easy task, but while making the process easier, we must also ensure that the integrity of the process is maintained. And whilst we don't, by and large, have any great problem with electoral fraud, I think we should always be vigilant. It's also bear worth bearing in mind what we're aiming to achieve and what can be achieved. We're aiming to achieve a higher turnout and greater participation of people in the electoral process. Of course, there are countries such as North Korea where you have 100% turnout. Well, we know why that is. But regardless of recent comparisons, I'm sure that's not the Sc Scottish government's aim to replicate their efforts, even if it is granted independence. Of course, there is a proportion of people on the electoral register who, for one reason or another, should not be there. Indeed, the, when I spoke to the Electoral Commission, they said that it was previously suggested there are only 85.5% of the records on the electoral register are accurate, for many, many reasons, most of them genuine. So, presiding officer, I welcome this consultation, although I do think it is part of a wider effort, and there are many other factors which must be considered if we are to breathe life back into our local democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we now move to open debate. Four minute speeches are thereby. I call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Alex Rowley. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, and uh, Mr. Buchanan has already mentioned the work that uh, John Wilson and Anne McTaggart have done on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. And I won't go over uh, in any depth the work that they have carried out because I know that they will have a, a fair amount to say uh, on the subject. Uh, but I am pleased that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee took uh, the option to actually look at voting. And beyond that, in terms of our current workload, uh, I hope that we will see increased participation uh, coming from, for example, the Community Empowerment Bill, which I think is extremely important uh, in getting people to participate locally. Uh, a number of colleagues, Mark MacDonald, and McTaggart and I uh, recently undertook a visit to Germany, uh, Denmark and Sweden, uh, a whistle-stop tour. Uh, but one of the things which uh, I can never get over is the fact that when we talk to local politicians in these countries uh, about participation and uh, community engagement, they find it very difficult to get what we were on about in terms of community engagement because it just happens. 
it seems, uh, in these countries. And that is the kind of attitude I think that we need. That's not to say that everything in the garden is rosy uh, in these places, because they are seeing uh, turnout reducing too. Uh, but their turnout rates are still much higher uh, than they are here, particularly for local government elections. Although there were great concerns uh, in Germany um, about actually putting the local government and European elections together, because there was a bit of a fear that the local government turnout would actually reduce. Uh, interesting, I have to say, presiding officer, I haven't checked those uh, results and turnouts. Uh, that's something that I should probably do. Uh, one of the things which I think is absolutely vital is to leave no stone unturned in terms of trying to ease the process uh, of folk being able to vote. I've believed for a very long time that 16 and 17 year olds should be given the right to vote. I'm glad that that's happening in the referendum. I believe that that should happen uh, in every election uh, because I think that there's sometimes a disconnect Ms. Boyack was talking about going into schools and talking to, to kids there. And a lot of the time, younger kids are particularly enthusiastic about the entire process, particularly uh, if you have a wee vote yourself while, while you're there. Um, so, you know, I think something happens at a certain point, And I do think that if we allowed 16 and 17 year olds to vote at every election, uh, that we could keep folk engaged that bit longer. Uh, I, I don't really have time, Mr. Buchanan. I'm really sorry. And you're in your um, last minute. Uh, you know, I think post universal postal voting um, pilot is a, an immensely good idea. I do think that we should be looking at online telephone and app voting. Um, Mr. Ka uh, Buchanan talked about in integrity, and we've got to make sure that folk trust the system. Um, and I, I do think that sometimes folk are a bit suspicious themselves about new voting methods. What we've got to ensure presiding officer, that every single uh, thing that we put in place is robust, because what we don't want to see is a situation uh, like the Robin Williams film, Man of the Year, where Tom Dobbs is a, comedi a comedian, is elected president of the United States because of faulty Delacroix voting machines. Um, so I think that we've got to test, we've got to make sure that things are absolutely robust, but we've got to do it because I really do think that we have got to increase participation. Thank you, presiding officer. And thank you. I would say there is a very modest amount of time available for interventions, but it is only a small amount. Alex Rowley to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. I'm, I'm reminded, um, I think it was Billy Conley that said, don't vote, you only encourage them. And perhaps, perhaps um, I did this morning at the Local Government Committee mention to the, the Minister that I think in Sh Orkney and Shetland, for example, local government elections, the voting was a bit higher um, than it was in the mainland. And they don't have political parties. And for me, that's the starting point, is that all political parties, political groups, need to take some kind of responsibility for how people actually feel. Um, I accept that, that Tavis is obviously elected in Shetland, but generally in local government, they're independents. Um, and I think political parties need to, to accept some kind of responsibility. Uh, the way that we campaign, the way that we organise, the way that we tend to avoid answering questions directly, and the way that we tend to campaign against each other. Um, the council tax is a classic of that. In my own by-election, I was forever being accused of saying things that I hadn't said about council tax. And really, all we do is turn the public off. So, so fundamentally, um, a key issue is political parties themselves, I would suggest. Um, the, the public have had enough of us, and, and we really need to reform how we go about doing our business. If you look at the evidence for the Local Government Committee as well, looking at this issue, it was Professor James Mitchell that said, uh, when we look at turnout and participation in elections for different levels of government across liberal democracies, we find that turnout is far higher in elections for levels of government that have more power. 
And I think, again, that's an area that we need to look at. Local government, um, social work, education will take up something between 60, uh, 76, 80 per cent of the budget. You take some of the other statutory services round about that. Actually, when we talk about devolving into communities, we're, we're, we're at the margins of local government and we're, we're at the margins of local government uh, budgets. Um, so, 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 so we need to look at that. We need to look at an honest discussion about how local government is funded. And I did at the local government committee this morning. I asked the minister if he would accept, once we get past the referendum, regardless of the outcome of the referendum, perhaps we can then get everyone in this chamber to start to come together and have a serious debate and a serious discussion about what local government looks like and, more crucially, how local government is funded. There is major pressures, and again, without getting into a debate in terms of local government finance and the amount of funds that they've actually got. We know from demographics, we know from the number of young people that are coming into the care of local authorities, the demands on local government services are growing and growing. Um, and regardless of the, the, the political colour of the government in this place or any other place for that matter, we need to have a serious grown-up discussion with local government and with local communities about how local government is funded. And I do hope that once we get past this referendum, I accept it would be difficult to get it before then, but once we get past the referendum, we actually can start to have that discussion. Um, so whilst, whilst I agree we need to look at all these other sort of technical issues about improving voting, there's something more fundamental uh, um, at the heart of the issue why people are not voting. I am supporting the motion put forward, by, uh, the amendment put forward by Sarah Boyack, because again, I'm sure many people in here that are campaigning will um, have, have, have saw for themselves when you go out with an electoral register and you start to knock up in areas, if you go into areas where there's higher deprivation, um, you actually find that there are a, a lot of streets where there are just house after house after household where they're not in the electoral register. And again, I think that's why it's right to flag that point up. I hope the Minister will take that on board and we can have consensus at the end of this debate today. But in conclusion, um, Presiding Officer, um, yes, all these other things that have been talked about we should look at, but much more fundamentally than that, let's look at ourselves, let's look at political parties and let's look at how we finance local government. Thanks so much. Now call on Tavis, uh, John Mason to be followed by Tavis Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, while the consultation looks at different methods of voting, I do again want to underline the point made in paragraph 212, where it says the Electoral Commission has previously recommended that a new model of multiple voting methods uh, should be developed. And that certainly should include the traditional method of physically voting on a piece of paper in a polling place. I'm happy that there will be additions to that and alternatives, as we already have some. But I think improvements could be made, especially to the location of polling places, and so I would like to focus on polling places in the short time available. We have a number of issues in my own constituency, and I've raised some of these with Glasgow City Council and have seen some movement, but on the whole, the Council has been unresponsive. Firstly, uh, on location of polling places, one of my wards is Calton, uh, which is a very mixed area. Uh, we have a lot of new housing, mainly flats, uh, around High Street, Glasgow Cross, St Andrews in the Square, which some members uh, may be familiar with, yet there is no polling place at all in that area. Residents who live there tend to look to the merchant city and the city centre for work and leisure opportunities. They do not look further east into traditional Carlton, but they're expected to vote at a polling place which has over 4,000 electors in the one building uh, meant to be uh, voting, uh, which is located outside their area. Now, over time, attitudes may change, and I would like to think that they would change, and people are more relaxed about going to different parts of the city. But I think the current reality is we are expecting voters there to vote in an area they're not familiar with and may not feel comfortable in. I do accept that compared to rural areas, the actual distances in miles within the city are not so great. However, there is an issue in Glasgow, and I suspect in other cities, where people may be reluctant to travel to certain areas, either because they're unfamiliar with them or whatever, and we do want to make it as easy as possible for people to get to the ballot box. This is not just, I believe, about staffing and resources, eh, in that an additional polling place eh, could not be found where I consider it's needed. The contrast with that is in Berlanark, where I stay myself, 
and uh, there are two primary schools just literally across the road from each other, and one of them has a community centre attached to it. So logically, I would have thought the community centre would have been the place uh, for everybody to vote. But no, the two schools are completely closed, and each of the two schools across the road from each other are polling places. And there, there are less than few, fewer than 3,000, in fact, 2,819 electors at the last count, and with a 17% turnout, 476 people between them uh, at the European elections. Um, so, but, so, so the, the, the fact that they're not using a community centre, which would seem to me the obvious place uh, to look at. Looking at the wider issue of polling places, there clearly is resistance from parents to schools and nurseries being closed. And related to that, I think, is the fact that we expect people to go into often quite a large and maybe not very welcoming building, which is completely quiet on polling day, eh, apart from eh, the few people who are actually going in to vote. And I, frankly, I do not find that, and I think a lot of people do not find that, a very attractive setting. Now, a comparison I would draw is with people visiting libraries, which has also been a problem over the years. And to be fair to Glasgow Life, they have made inroads in this by uh, changing the locations of libraries, which now often share a swimming pool or a cafe, uh, and where there's IT available. Uh, and there's a lot of things to draw people into the building where the library uh, actually is. Now, that may not be possible for legal uh, reasons at the moment, but I think we should be thinking about moving that. Instead of bringing the people to where the ballot boxes are, let's take the ballot boxes to where the people are. Could we do some in shopping centres, in supermarkets, in coffee shops? What about giving people a voucher uh, to uh, have a decent coffee if they voted, rather than fining them, which is maybe the negative way of doing it? Uh, just on Labour's amendment, I would say again, empowering local government and local communities is not the same thing. Uh, and I think we need to move power down to the local communities. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Tavis Scott to be followed by John Wilson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Is there any help to John Mason? In the recent uh, European elections, uh, we didn't use any schools at all. I take Mr Mason's point absolutely about uh, parents being darned annoyed when their kids aren't at school. Uh, and we've used now for some elections um, community halls and other facilities, sports, uh, sports facilities and so on and so forth. But I do take his point, although I was slightly, I wasn't quite sure about his point about buying everyone a cup of coffee before they voted. There used to be some law about treating in the past. I don't know if that one's still on the statute book, uh, and I'm sure he wasn't suggesting that, but I, I take his point. I have to say to Alec Rowley, I hate to tell him this, but I was actually a Liberal Democrat when I was elected to Shetland Lands Council, but he's absolutely right. There are no uh, political um, candidates or rather political councillors in my part of the world at the moment, nor are there in Orkney. But it's a, it's a judgment call, isn't it? Because uh, just as, uh, as uh, Alec Rowley and indeed the minister represented their parties with great distinction at local government level, they probably knew what they were going to achieve uh, when they were taking through policies in their councils. I'd have to say at times with my own council at home, they don't necessarily know what's going to happen at the start of a full council meeting, whether it's on the school estate or whether it's on funding for uh, elderly people or whatever. So I guess these are the choices we have. But it did strike me that when he was making those observations, one of the other aspects to it is encouraging younger people to stand, not just to vote, but to stand for election. I mean, I look at the youthful Mr Mackay here. He was a young man when he was first elected. I was 27 when I was first elected to Shetlands Council. I dare say I was 20 years younger than anyone else in the chamber. And that was a shocking indictment, I think, of our ability to attract, a certainly in Shetland, to attract um, a younger generation into, uh, into stand and, uh, and to take their role in that sense as well. Um, I absolutely take the Minister's point uh, in his introduction about uh, Europe and what that meant. Well, I think we were very different, were we not, in terms of how those European elections worked out, because at least we kept our debate about um, the rights and wrongs of some of those big issues, whereas some of the parties that were elected across Europe had some pretty just pretty unpleasant sides to them. Indeed, when I look at Greece, I think there's some uh, trouble at store uh, in terms of how that will uh, come. The only thing I would observe, maybe I could observe this to all of my political colleagues across the parties, is that the only party who really made Europe the big issue was the party who got hammered in those elections. So it doesn't have to automatically follow that if you, uh, if you take on the issue that is being debated in that election, it does you any good whatsoever. But I try to think that actually that was for other, uh, other and different reasons rather than uh, uh, because it should have been about uh, Europe. So I do agree that the uh, importance of this debate is to concentrate on what we could do to engage and encourage more people to, get uh, to, to, to vote at a local level. And many good ideas have... Um, 
been made so far. Can I give the Minister maybe three uh, very brief, exa three brief um, examples that I think are worth considering? The first one is again on John Mason's point about not just local, uh, not just local elections, but actually local communities. Uh, the Land Reform Review Group was published just the other uh, week, and they did see set out a path for how local communities can have more control over their areas, and that's a, a, a very different approach to the one that we've maybe seen in recent times that maybe Cameron Buchanan uh, referred to, and it certainly is a party that favours radical land reform uh, and took the Land Reform Act through the first parliament of this, uh, of, of this institution after 1999. I think the reviews group, uh, review group's work is important, and we in this parliament have that opportunity to help create strong and engaged local communities. The other two examples I might give to the Minister would be, firstly, local income tax. Now, I know it's, uh, it's something that he and I probably share, although he's probably not allowed to at the moment. But hopefully, as Alec Rowley rightly said, when we get past the referendum, uh, whatever result it comes to, uh, we might get back into the real proper debate about how we actually fund our, our local councils, because they don't have financial accountability. They didn't have a lot in truth in 1999. I'm not arguing for a minute that the situation was perfect in 1999. As Sarah Boyack and I, who shared a lot of ministerial time together, will remember a lot of uh, those debates. But we didn't make, frankly, any much progress uh, in that time. But it's got worse since uh, then. I don't expect, uh, of course, Derek Mackay to... Derek Mackay to agree with me on this, but please, I'm not making a political point. I'm just observing that in a practical sense, the councillors that I elect at home in my part of the world now have less financial accountability than they've ever had before. And for those of us who do come from a local government background, I think we would all want to see that reversed and that changed. And maybe we can genuinely have that debate uh, in the future. And the final point is just on that, on centralisation. I do think that it's important also to try and make some progress to rebalance where the powers sit. And I think that's a very live agenda for all of us. I'd like to see our councils with more responsibility but I do think that goes hand in hand with the financial accountability, which I suspect we all crave. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on John Wilson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate uh, as it deals with many of the issues that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee examined as part of a short inquiry into the 2012 Scottish Local Government elections, with Anne McTaggart and myself acting as reporters for the inquiry. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those organisations and individuals who provided evidence during that investigation uh, that allowed us to draw up a report. The, we made a number of recommendations to the Scottish Government for change and, more importantly, improvement in the election process. And, that, and it supports advances in the voting methods which the Minister has outlined today, whilst recognising the need for thorough security be, to be in place in terms of the voting system, any voting system that's introduced. The 2012 local government elections, as previously mentioned, recorded a voter turnout figure of 39.8%. This was the lowest voter turnout since unitary authorities were created, but the first decoupled elections since 1995. The committee endorsed the Electoral Commission's position that discussions should take place between local authorities, political parties and the Electoral Management Board for Scotland regarding local restrictions on the display of election posters. In evidence, we heard that there may be issues about the lack of publicity around the election day, particularly in relation to the banning of electoral material on lampposts and other billboards. Furthermore, the Electoral Commission has commissioned research on the issue of, alternative, of an alternative voting day. For example, it has been suggested that the alternative day may be on a Saturday. Research conducted by ICM on behalf of the Electoral Commission highlights the many reasons for people voting, and with 24% of those stating that the lack of time and or too busy to vote found to be topping that particular poll. At the 2012 Scottish Local Government election, there was also 16,742 postal votes were rejected, with this accounting for 4% of the total return. The high rejection of postal votes is clearly a matter of concern. Voters were not notified that their ballot papers had been rejected. This matter needs to be addressed as a priority, especially in respect to ensuring best practice in terms of the verification process. When talking about engaging with the wider public, then there are good examples currently being applied. In written evidence to the inquiry, Dr James Gilmore from the Electoral Reform Society made reference to the Electoral Office for Northern Ireland visiting secondary schools to get pupils to register on the electoral roll, something that's been mentioned previously in this debate, but something that sh maybe should be taken forward to ensure we get young people on the electoral register. 
There are significant aspects when it comes to voting itself, and in particular the ordering of the ballot papers. There is considerable evidence of alphabetical voting, with around 60% of voters giving their first preference to the candidate higher up the paper in the 2007 local government elections, as identified by Curtis and Marsh in their report in 2008. The report from the committee recommended that some form of ordering should be looked at in time for the next 2017 Scottish local government elections. I would cite Ron Gould's suggestion that ordering for each ward should be determined by a ballot of all candidates. I always find the publication the uh, Scottish Council elections results and statistics by Bushell, Denver and Stevens, published by the University of Lincoln in 2012, offers useful analysis and context in terms of the turnout. Presiding officer, there are a number of other issues uh, that we should be aware of when we're discussing local government elections and should be taken forward. And I welcome the work being done by the Scottish Government in terms of their consultation. Uh, but clearly, we have to get the message right to the electorate. We have to make sure that all the systems that can be put in place are utilised to maximise the vote, whether that be in the local government elections, Scottish government elections, or any other elections that may be held within Scotland. So we have to look to the future and find systems that actively engage with voters to make sure they turn out. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I am keen to contribute to this debate on the subject of local government elections, delivering improvements in participation and administration. Given my position as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee and my previous role as a Glasgow City Councillor, and in general um, having a huge interest on encouraging people to vote. From my own experience, I too recognise the pattern of chronic disengagement between communities and their local representatives. I am deeply concerned by the 20% fall in turnout for local government elections since 1999, and I fear that this could be a continuing trend if we do not take action to address the problems that we face now. It has been well documented that a turnout as low as we have experienced in the recent years has potential to lead to a democratic deficit of local government in Scotland. The result of this is an absence of democratic accountability and a weak mandate for local councillors to assume any form of control over the decision-making process. The only way around this depressing lack of engagement in local government is to hand over real power and influence to authority areas across the country. If people understand that the local council has the ability and, crucially, the resources to bring about change to their community, they will understand the value of their vote. We need, what is needed is a radical approach that provides for local government in Scotland and affords opportunities for community development and the empowerment of ordinary people in the decision-making process. Local government should be an outward-looking and seek to engage with communities at every stage of its process. I firmly believe that a system should be put in place that establishes a clearer distinction between the roles of central and local government in determining council budgets. This will allow a fairer budget settlement for local authorities, whilst also making, a far clearer, uh, making it far clearer to ordinary electors what the role of each local government actually does. It is only when people know who they are voting for and what they are voting for and why that they can communicate the value of the local government elections and their impact that it has on their communities. Another issue which I believe requires urgent attention is the participation of women as council candidates. We know that less than one in four councillors are women, a figure lower than that for both MSPs and MPs. It is for all political parties and local governments itself to reverse this trend. And we must ensure that we have a system of local government that truly, truly, tr sorry, truly reflects the diversity of the people that it claims to represent. Presiding officer, we have seen the decline in turnout in voter participation in local government a growing gender gap in local elections and an unassessed inequality in voting for younger and economically disadvantaged citizens. 
as previously mentioned by my colleague Sarah Boyack. We must work together to address each of these points in order to improve the participation in elections and the administration of local government. We should move towards increasing voter turnout by enfranchising 16 and 17 year olds and allowing for better public access and information. We should also seriously consider the introduction of alternative voting methods, including proxy voting, postal voting, electronic machine voting, online voting and telephone voting, to facilitate the accessibility of elections. Through these pr proposals, we may be able to achieve a greater efficiency, transparency and accountability in Scottish local government. Thank you. Thank you. I will mean, now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And, um, I take on board the point about ensuring that we can get people registered to vote, and I think that's absolutely critical. But one of the things that I would say as well is we need to ensure that electoral registers are then kept up to date. And one of the things that I encountered recently in the Dunfermline by-election was when I would knock on doors and find that there were people on the electoral register at an address who, were, who I was told had not lived at that address for between five to eight years, yet their name was still listed against an address. So it's good to get people onto the register, but we have to ensure that when they are no longer resident in an area, we can get those names taken off the register because, again, that will uh, impact on issues such as, for example, turnout and participation. I think the, the discussion around voting methods is an important one, and I think there is a, there's a very good example that can be used to highlight uh, the impact that alternative voting methods can have, and that is if we look at the situation in the city of Aberdeen in 2012, where uh, on the 1st of March 2012, the, the city held a city-wide referendum on uh, the proposals for regeneration of Union Terrace Gardens. Now, I don't want to open up the debate again around the merits or demerits of that proposal, because that's passed. But if we look at how that was conducted, um, it was done by an all postal ballot, but also uh, augmented by phone and online voting. And what you saw was more than 86,000 votes being cast in that referendum, a turnout of some 52%. Fast forward just a couple of months later to the local government election and you see a 33.7% turnout for the local government election just a short space of time later. What that tells me is that by providing an all postal ballot and augmenting it with online and phone voting, you boosted the voter turnout, albeit it was on a single issue, but nonetheless, I think that there is merit in looking at whether that is something that could be replicated because it did result in a differential turnout in that referendum as compared against the election day itself. And I note that the Electoral Commission conducted a survey where 52% of those questions who, questioned who had not voted said it was due to circumstances preventing them from doing so. Now, the constituency that I represent and that my, my colleague Kevin Stewart represents, and I suspect also Tavish Scott and other members, has a high proportion of offshore workers, for example, people who often find themselves rotated onto the rigs during the period of an election. For them, postal voting is important, proxy voting is important, but for many of them, it's the requirement to actually take on that postal vote or that proxy vote. And I found myself having to chase people to get them signed up to a postal vote or to a proxy vote in order that their vote can be counted at an election. Moving to something along the lines of universal postal voting or even online voting as well, where they could cast their vote from the offshore rig rather than having to be resident at their address would allow for these people to participate more readily in the election. And I noted the report that Crawford Langley, who uh, was the returning officer for the referendum on Union Terrace Gardens and is somebody who I think it would be a benefit to the Minister to seek advice from uh, in respect of what he's proposing, um, that when it came to the issues around uh, potential for voter fraud or potential for multiple casting of votes, he identified out of those more than 86,000 votes a total of 74 cases where somebody had voted both electronically and by post, a tiny minority of individuals who had done so. And in many cases, people had written on their ballot that they were simply posting the ballot having voted online because they wanted to be secure in the knowledge that their vote was being counted. So I think that the, the issue around the potential for fraud in these circumstances, and let's not forget that the current system allows anybody to walk into a polling station and claim to be Betty Smith of number five uh, and, and simply cast the vote uh, on that person's behalf without needing to produce identification. So there is already the opportunity there where people to exploit it for voter fraud to take place. And one final thing I would say, presiding officer, 
I agree entirely with what Tavish Scott said around encouraging more young people to stand, and I would reflect my own experience, having been elected to Aberdeen City Council at the tender age of 26, uh, by no means the youngest councillor at the time. We had a councillor elected at the age of 18 who became the Deputy Provost of the City. And it was the reaction to that, that that caused me great concern and suggested to me that young people might find themselves put off politics. We were castigated as being kids. Uh, we were castigated as not being mature enough to make decisions uh, on behalf of the people. And if we want young people to get involved in politics, to stand for politics, we have to make them feel that they're going to be valued when they stand and participate. And I think we have to look very carefully at how these sort of things are reacted to by not just the media, but also by political parties uh, in, in their responses to these things. So I think much to think about, but I, I think there's been a lot of constructive input so far today. Many thanks. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The outcome of, of local elections shape our lives in many ways, from how our local schools are organised to when our bins are collected. Yet increasingly more people are opting not to take part in our local democracy. The 20% drop in turnout that colleagues have talked about in the local elections since 1999 is a huge concern, and it's absolutely vital that measures are put in place to both halt and reverse this decline. Both Derek Mackay and Sarah Boyack already, have already highlighted the fact that participation is falling fast amongst the young and amongst the poorest voters. And this is a huge concern. And it's not just a concern with local elections, it's an issue with all elections. And it's an issue that we're only going to address with radical solutions. We've all knocked on doors and been told, I never vote because politics doesn't affect me, or I don't know anything about politics. But this isn't just about voter apathy. Many people have just got such busy lives that they're not able to get to the polling station on election day. As John Mason highlighted, many of the polling stations are just in the wrong place. And we've got to do a lot more to make voting as easy and as accessible as possible. And moving to universal postal voting and same day registration may help, but obviously there's lots of other avenues that we can go down. Um, sometimes it's hard for many voters to tell that there's an election on, and I think this is especially the case in the European elections. There's quite a few doors that are knocked on on election day. They'd have no idea there was even an election on on that day. Um, the fact that election posters and lamp posts are banned in many areas may be a bonus for party workers, but it's certainly not a bonus when it comes to raising awareness of elections. And with many of us um, targeting core voters and swing voters, less time is now spent in persuading the reluctant or cynical to get out to vote. Um, and I, I welcome the Electoral Commission's recommendations that, we take, that discussions take place and how better to publicise the 2017 Council elections, and I hope that these can, can be progressed. In respect of young voters, it's absolutely vital that politics and elections play a much bigger part in the school curriculum. I know this has been proposed by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, and I hope that more work will be done by the Scottish Government to make this a reality. Uh, the IPPR report, Divided Democracy, suggests making voting compulsory for first-time voters, and this is an issue that um, a colleague across the chamber mentioned. Um, they argue that if young people vote in their first election, then they're more likely to vote throughout their lives. And if more young people vote, then their voices will be less difficult for politicians to ignore. So that's also an issue we need to explore. Like everyone here in the chamber, I spend a lot of time visiting schools and speak, speaking to school children about democracy and the work of our parliament. And I'm hopeful that when it is their turn to uh, time to tur turn to vote, sorry, uh, we do see change because the young people I speak to are certainly very informed and interested in politics. And most of the young people I'm speaking to in the doorstep too about the referendum are really excited about being able to cast their vote for the first time on the 18th of September. Uh, but it's a lot easier to enthuse votes in an election which has got the power to change lives radically for better or for worse. It's a lot harder getting people to the polls when many people see councils as just being about bins and streetlights rather than having the power to shape and change our local communities. It doesn't help, too, that many councillors simply don't look anything like the communities they represent. Anne McTaggart has already highlighted this. And while progress has been made, the fact is that women and young people in particular remain seriously underrepresented in local councils across Scotland. And all political parties need to take action to address this issue, which is simply unhealthy for democracy. Three out of four of our local councillors are men. And the image of pale, male and stale may be a bit of a generalisation, but often it is the reality. <laughs> no no offence, Richard Lyle. Um, a recent report by Asda Mums Index found that only 2% of mums feel politically represented. That's just not good for democracy. And whether it's on the council, whether it's here at Holyrood, whether it's at Westminster, our elected representatives need to better reflect the communities they serve. To conclude, we often hear the SNP members say that 
One of the bonuses of independence is it will get the government we vote for. Well, the reality is that in many elections, the majority don't vote at all. We spend a huge amount of time in this chamber debating whether we should be part of the UK, but we don't spend enough time looking at where the power should lie here in Scotland. Um, and so while I welcome the report here today, I hope that it can lead to change. I think we also need to renew our local democracy and be more ambitious about the power that is put back into our local communities and to, into the hands of our local people. Thank you. I now call Colin Beattie to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Presiding officer, up until the uncoupling of the Scottish Parliament and Council vote for the 2011 and 12 elections, Turnout for local elections was relatively high, and while the decoupling of these elections was necessary in the wake of the many serious fa failings which haunted the 2007 election, only 39.1% turned out to vote in the 2012 election, a drop of 13.7% on 2007. And indeed, in the previous three elections, voter turnout was slightly lower in the council elections than the holiday elections. I'm not entirely sure why there's such a difference between parliamentary and local authority elections, and Perhaps it shows a mistaken lack of belief in the relevance of local government. But we, work, we must work towards a solution to ensure legitimate authority. There's a famous saying, if you don't vote, you can't complain about what you get, although indeed people will anyway. The problem is that a lack of turnout results in, cer results in a certain lack of uh, legitimacy for any council or government. One very important part of this consultation is the proposal to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds. And my firm belief is that if you're old enough to work, pay tax, get married and join the army, then surely you're old enough to make a reasoned decision on your country's future. At that age, young people will have a vested interest in the outcome and what it will mean for their education or employment prospects. I understand the argument that there are some immature teenagers who wouldn't necessarily take this responsibility seriously. However, I think these teenagers would most likely form part of the electorate that frankly don't turn out. But I still think that's a real shame, and I do believe that the solution is to have more interaction with students both in and out of school. By being more proactive, we can reach them with more information and hopefully increase the level of interest in local and national politics, which might provide a sustainable boost to turnout at elections. Perhaps we can enthuse, enthuse and inspire future generations to participate in politics. There is, however, a key barrier to part of this idea in that schools have, quite correctly, strict guidelines on access and impartiality. How we reasonably manage that is a challenge. The consultation also looks at alternative voting, methods for local council elections, and provides four very interesting proposals, including universal postal voting, telephone voting, online voting, and electronic machine voting. And these are all interesting suggestions and have their good and bad points. Universal postal voting is particularly interesting because it removes the argument that people didn't know about the election and people can do it from the comfort of their own homes. However, there are two significant problem with it, problems with it. Firstly, there's an issue over security in terms of how confident you could be that each vote was cast by the registered voter it was intended for. And secondly, would voters mistakenly bin the forms or put it off and just forget about it? But I do acknowledge that postal voters are more likely to vote, as shown in the 2010 general election, which saw 83% of postal votes uh, returned, the 2000, the two, compared with 63% of those who could only vote at the polling station. However, it could be argued that those registered for a postal vote were more likely to vote because they had gone to the trouble to arrange it. Electronic machine voting doesn't do much for turnout, but it provides faster results and arguably could reduce the number of spoilt ballots. However, given the failed use of electronic counting machines in 2007, I would be cautious about the use of machines which may suffer from unforeseen system errors and lead to invalidating an election. I believe the future may be online and telephone voting, although at the moment there are concerns of the security of these message methods, especially online. The increasing threat of cyber terrorism and malware is becoming ever more present, and that does represent a massive problem. Overall, Social media has truly re-energised politics, and social media has brought politicians to the people. And perhaps we need to bring the election to them as well. Perhaps we should become the world's first ever pilot of hashtag voting. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I'm in favour of extending the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, but we do need to engage with them more to ensure they're adequately informed when they come to vote. The key idea we should be focusing on is to making registration and voting more accessible by taking polling day to the people. Thank you.
Many thanks. I now call Margaret McDougall to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Local government elections are vital, and this Parliament must do everything it can to improve not only the way in which these elections are run, but also to increase participation within these elections. The 2007 elections were marked by scandal when both the Scottish Parliament and local government elections had a much higher rejected ballot paper count than was expected. For example, in 2003, only 0.77 per cent of local government ballot papers were rejected. In 2007, this increased to 1.83 per cent. This was also the first election that the single transferable vote was used at local government elections. Further issues with electronic counting led to the Scottish Parliament and local government elections being decoupled. However, in the 2012 elections, the rejected ballot paper number was still 1.71%, which shows that there are still issues with the SDV system and voters' understanding of it. Decoupling of the elections has also led to a dramatic fall in participation. In 2007, turnout was 52.8%, while in 2012, it fell to 39.8%. This means that 68.2% of these registered to vote didn't feel it was important enough to turn up, and this should be of concern to all of us. In the Labour Party, we strongly believe in initiatives to increase citizen participation on local issues. And ultimately, the best way to achieve this is by re-empowering local government. Throughout the SNP's time in government, we have seen massive centralisation of local government. Instead of empowering citizens, power has been taken away. Local democracy is decreasing and local people feel disconnected from the process. Throughout our Devolution Commission, we have argued for a radical agenda for local government and community re-empowerment, including, but not limited to, an adjustment of powers and responsibilities to suit local circumstances, fixing the broken system of local government finance and allowing authorities more scope to influence economic development. By moving power further down the chain, empowering local people and local government, we can better target the disconnect that is felt at local levels. However, we must also work to make sure voting systems move with the times and citizenship education is made part of the curriculum through personal and social education in schools. While I hear it can be, it's not currently required as part of the curriculum for excellence. In terms of modernising the voting system, we have a range of options available to us, such as online voting, telephone voting, universal postal votes, or even mandatory voting. I'm not suggesting we move wholesale to one system or another, but to look into whether more systems could be utilised in conjunction with traditional polling places to make voting more flexible and accessible. While there are security issues associated with some of these methods, Methods. Many people are happy to use online banking systems, so I would imagine they would also find voting online acceptable. Presiding officer, there is no quick fix to the issues presented here today, but I would like to see this government making a start to increasing participation by re-empowering local government and local communities, ensuring citizenship, education is a requirement of the Curriculum for Excellence and set up a programme to try on new systems of voting so we can have truly representative res results in future elections. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Patterson, I'd be grateful if you'd refrain from turning your back in the chair and chatting while other members are speaking. Thank you very much. I now call Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> I first stood in a local government election in 1974 in Orbison-Bell eventually being elected in 1976, winning 10 local council elections in a row, most under the old system. In 1976, when I was first elected, over 3,000 people, two-thirds of the electorate, voted in my Orbison local ward. This number has been falling steadily ever since. In the most recent local elections in 2012, the Belsell Ward had a percentage poll of only 36.36%. 36 years on, voting has fallen by nearly a half. North Larchland Council had a turnout of only 37.7%, 
and Scotland as a whole had a turnout over 39 per cent. Granted, there may have been extenuated circumstances for that particular turnout, as it was the first Council election devolved from the Scottish Parliament elections, but it does not change the fact that something must be done to improve these figures and to re-engage the public. It must be rem remembered that elections are for the people, not for politicians. Elections are the cornerstone of our democracy. It is clear with the low turnout for the recent European elections, but with a projected turnout of 80 per cent for the upcoming referendum, the people of Scotland are clearly happy to vote for something that they see as important. It is now important, I would suggest, keeping the interest, engagement and enthusiasm that the current referendum debate has produced to ensure that it is capitalised on and not lost after the 18th of September. I am not the most techy, savvy person. However, it is clear to me that the electoral process has not kept up with technology developments over recent times. It is my belief that technology must be embraced in elections allowing people to vote via text, email or via, via the internet by means of an election app or even a mobile phone election app or even when shopping. Obviously, we already allow postal votes. Postal voting application in North Lancashire has risen from 2,000 to over 10,000 in the last number of years. The application for a postal vote has changed over the years. You don't need a doctor's line or you don't need a signature to confirm you're unwell to vote at polling stations. You now fill in a simple application form, date it, sign it, put down when the elections you want to have the postal vote for. I therefore see a few difficulties in implementing safeguards to allow an electronic type of voting, which will help encourage many people to vote, even from their armchairs. Many young people now vote for their hit tune in the top 100 every Sunday by downloading their favourite tune. So why not allow them to download their favourite political party at election time, or all political parties, or are, or are all uh, political parties scared of losing control of the way that people vote because all political parties do not do like to control voting intentions by various means, polls, canvassing, target leafleting, doorstep canvassing to get their vote out. Wherever possible, young people should be encouraged to engage the, in the political process, which has already been done to a great extent in the in independence referendum on the 18th September by allowing 16 and 17-year-olds to vote. And I am encouraged that the Scottish Government is seeking views on the extension of the vote to this age group. Technology alone will not solve this problem. As studies have shown, that internet voting, voting simply means that those who have voted anyway vote by a different method. In this day and age, I find it hard to believe that it is not possible for a member of the public to turn up at a polling station, legally register and vote all at the same time. This is a system that has been implemented in some areas in America. The evidence from this suggests that same-day registration increased voting turnout significantly. Ordinary people have many things going on in their lives. They are not politicians. They are not committed to the political process as we are. We must bring the old saying back, power to the people. I welcome, as should all parties, the Scottish Government's consultation document, Scotland's electoral future, delivering improvements and its commitment to improve the quality of democracy. And with the consultations, it is important that everyone support what is being done. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the closing speeches. And as I'm sure members will know, all members who participated in the debate should be back in the chamber for closing speeches. I call on Cameron Buchanan. Five minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. <clears throat> is my friend Dick Lyle suggesting that we sing while we vote? <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say that this afternoon has been, on the whole, quite constructive, and we're all in agreement that we must make it easier to participate in our local government elections. And many members have focused on specific areas. European elections, polling places, electoral register, online voting. John Wilson raised the matter of postal voting. And there are a number of examples of pilots where this has been run rather successfully. But in my opinion, the forms are too complicated and it shows that there's a disturbing amount of spoilt ballots for postal votes, which is, shouldn't really happen. I think we've got to simplify these. We should also bear in mind that there's a marked difference between a pilot and a full-scale rollout. And we should be aware of the potential difficulties of carrying out such a poll on such a large scale. As I referenced in my opening remarks, we must ensure that there are robust procedures in place to protect the integrity of the vote, so that security is protected. And we must be confident that people are able to exercise their right to vote free from coercion. A lot of people actually like going to the polls to vote. And I totally agree with my colleagues that we've got to, uh, in the community, that we've got to find places to vote, voting places that are 
uh, voter friendly without necessarily giving them a cup of coffee to bribe them for their vote. But I think this is very important. In, our, in um, Edinburgh, there are many schools there that are not used and uh, unfriendly places, cold and miserable in winter, which puts people off voting. Libraries next door are not used. I spoke to somebody about that and they said it's because of the, they can't get people to man the, the no janitors and they can't get people to man them. So uh, we need, I think, get more friendly places to vote and, and be prepared to, be think, to think about this as to why we, we have different voting places or, or unfriendly voting places. Um, I also think that we, if we change, if we make any changes, these can't come up with any way of compromises that we change our vote. The other aspect of which many of you have touched upon is ensures that, ensuring that voters understand the system of voting. What is that and what it is that they're voting for and the responsibilities of local government, which they don't always understand. I mean, we all know when we go on the doorsteps, whatever the elections, they talk about something that isn't necessarily part of, uh, that isn't necessarily, you know, if it's a local election, they talk about Europe. If it's Europe, they talk about local stuff. And I think we have to try and engage them about this. Also, I, perhaps it is my opinion, but I think I'm very much in favour of getting 16, 70 year olds being allowed to vote. And we should encourage this. This is, after all, they can do everything else. My colleagues have said there. They should be allowed to vote in all elections. And I really do think we should get that done. I'm not sure that my party necessarily agrees with all that. However, <laughs> that's, that's what I can say here. And I can't be corrected. So I actually think it's right. Because, after all, it has proved now that the most enthusiasm that comes from this has been with the young people when you get out there. They're very keen to see it. You go and see these, uh, uh, these people in... Uh, council estates and everything, and they're just not engaged. But the younger people, they seem to think it's going to be relevant. And it's novel for them, too, to be fair. So I'm all in favour of that. When one considers the key aspects of the new curriculum for excellence, it is in developing responsible citizens, then democratic participation should surely play a part, a large part of our children's education. As Sarah says, when we go to schools, they're the ones who are really engaged, particularly these sort of, we have these schools meetings here, the sort of 10, 11, 12 year olds, they really like, they're really keen to know what's happening, and even in a non-political way. So I think this is important. I noticed with interest the comments of Dumfries and Galloway Council in which it stated the education system could help embed the importance of voting from an early age. And I think this is key here. When one considers the aspect of the curriculum for ex excellence, we've got to really move beyond the perfunctory voter information campaign drives and dry leaflets and look how we meaningfully understand from a young age that schools must consider the role they play in that process. Because I think we, we make the stuff too dry and too complicated. As I said in my opening remarks, this consultation is part of a wider process. Sarah Boyack's amendment is quite correct, and I will definitely be voting for it, in that we are to generally re-engage the public with local government, then we must make it relevant. But this consultation is about what we can do to improve the process of voting and make it easier for those who already want to take part. I think there's also been an important message from today's debate in which there are no quick fixes here at all. It is interesting to note that in Belgium, where there's compulsory voting, as I said earlier, the turnout was 89%, but it dropped for the European elections. And that's because people didn't think it was relevant. They just spot their ballot, or they went, into the, they went into the polling station and either tore it up or just you know, wrote rubbish on it, like we get here. I try to persuade people that when you spoil your ballot paper, it's a complete waste. Nobody pays attention to it. They, just, they, they think it's they're making their protest vote. Do we put those protests aside? No, we don't. They just go straight into a bucket. And they're, they're, they're. So we've got to persuade people that there's no point in going to vote for a sport ballot. I think there's a good deal of work to be done to, to engage the public in this, and it may take quite a bit of time to get the public to bear fruit on this. But it's important that we do all we possibly can to make the system easier whilst preserving the integrity of our local government voting. And also, fraud is very, very important. We all know we go to some of these houses where they say, oh, I'll fill in the ballot paper for you. It's about six people and it's all filled in. Um, and <laughs> whatever it is, it's, it's, I think that that is part of the problem. We'll never get around that, but I think we've got to try and I don't know if this online voting thing is really going to... It should vote, but I don't, I, it should work, but I can't see it really working, I must say, at the moment. I, I think the traditional... People want that. They want the postal vote. They don't want too many complicated types of voting. That's, it failed in 2000 and whatever it was, seven, when we had three different types of voting. There was masses of spot papers. In Edinburgh, it was a total disaster, whatever it was. I'm afraid so, you must come to a close, please. I'm just about to close now. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, but I do think we've really got to... <laughs> That's enough. I do think we actually got to um, uh, keep, preserve our integrity for the vote. Anyway, thank you very much. Many thanks. Sarah Boyack, seven minutes, please.
Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a really good debate this afternoon because we've been able to draw on the experience of people as former councillors, political activists, and probably members of local community groups. Um, so I think it has been a good debate, and I think there are lots and lots of practical um, ways that we could improve the voting process, the mechanics of voting, um, and I think the Minister's hopefully by the end of his consultation, we'll have quite a raft of suggestions as to way that, ways where there's probably going to be a degree of cross-party agreement. Um, the only caveat is probably that you have the most enthusiastic people in the Parliament engaged in this debate. Whether all of our parties will sign up as enthusiastically may be another matter. So let, let us be the people that try and persuade our parties we need to change, because I think that has to be part of the, the backdrop to this debate. Um, there are all sorts of issues about making it easier and things like much more publicity, um, the posters issue. I know locally some of my party were overjoyed when posters were banned. Others of us just thought that's really going to draw attention away from the day and people won't know it is voting day. So I think publicity is absolutely crucial. It might be posters, it might be the media, it might be local government itself, it might be what we do in the political parties, but we need to lift um, awareness about voting. I think particularly for young people, some very sensible suggestions made. And I think when you think about it, the role of local government is absolutely fundamental to young people's lives. Um, schools, the quality of education, local buses, support for young carers, libraries, sports facilities, housing, licensing policy, community safety, lots of the nuts and bolts of what local authorities do in terms of service provision have a massive effect on, local, on young people's lives. Maybe we need to do more to draw that out. And I think we do need a cultural shift, and that's partly what I'm alluding to in my amendment. It's partly about re-empowering local government. It's also about making the connection with local communities. Now, there have been lots of initiatives in local, gov uh, local council levels. Uh, youth councils, I've been to quite a few meetings of youth councils, but they seem to wax and wane over the years. If you've got a champion at the council level who's interested in that, they'll promote it. We've got the Scottish Youth Parliament. What lessons can we learn from their work in involving young people and having us shadowed? I've certainly met um, my youth parliamentarians over the years, and they bring an energy, they bring a perspective and a freshness about youth politics. We need to tap into that. We also need to tap into our own youth organisations in our own political parties. We need to do everything we can to encourage our young people to stand for election, whether it's to fight a seat that's winnable or whether it's to fight the, fight the cause. It's important to give young people that experience and give them the responsibility and give them the profile and trust young people to get involved. That goes for both our youth and our student movements. There are particular challenges in getting our young student movements involved, but I think we need to do more to make that work work. I think this has got to be about making local government more accessible and more empowered to take decisions closer to people and to actually make the connections. Now you could say that establishing the Scottish Parliament with a more proportional voting system was designed to do that as well and yet in our own votes um, we struggle to get much above 50%. So it is actually a major challenge. Empowerment is part of it. There's, an, a, there's a wider debate we may have about this, but there's more that we could do, and I think we need to focus on politically what we can all do in our different parties. There is a really strong um, message that came from the electoral reform research, which focused on the point that I think was made uh, particularly well, I think, by Cara Hilton, about the large numbers of people who actively choose not to vote. It's not just that they're not aware of it, they actively choose not to vote. They don't trust us as politicians at whatever level of um, elected representation. They don't trust our parties and we have to re-engage with them as political parties. And I think at the local level, that is something we all need to do. We need to make sure we get more effective engagement. We need to look at the best practice to make politics more relevant. And I think there is something about us not just focusing on involving people at election time, although that's crucial, but it's got to be between elections as well. It was one of the things I was keen to promote in the review of the Labour Party, which we conducted after 2011. Uh, we had lots of ideas because we had to go back and go back to first principles and say, how do we do this? 
and it certainly um, focused our interest on representational politics in terms of having more women, as Anne McTaggart mentioned, in terms of more young people, people from ethnic minority communities. There's a lot more that we could all do as political parties to make those connections, and I think we need to do it. If we don't, people will not be connected and they will not see the relevance of voting. I think the points made both by Tavish Scott and by Alec Rowley about local government finance need to be addressed by all of us. And it probably is in the aftermath of whatever happens in the referendum, but we need to start talking seriously about how we make local government finance work more effectively. It is unfinished business for all of us. I think it is essential if we're to see local government empowered, not just as service providers, and I think that's where some of the tensions come about centralisation. When we have laws that we pass here, because we don't want postcode lotteries, that leads to attention. We need to be upfront. We need to debate the consequences of that and still try and push power both to local authorities and to local communities. It has to be both and it has to be about a culture shift. And we all have to be involved in that in the parliamentarian level and at the local community level and the council level. We all have to be part of that and there will be tensions, but we need to own up to what those tensions are. But local government finance and powers for our local communities and the land reform changes and the community empowerment changes that need to come, I think they are part of that process. It might be about cooperatives, community ownership. It's about making those connections, not just in local groups, but then pushing it back into mainstream politics. I want to end on a quote um, from the Electoral Reform Society because it highlights the social justice perils of us not being engaged about the, the disconnection, particularly from people from low income backgrounds. They analysed the 2010 general election um, and the cuts that followed that. And they, they looked at the 2010 spending review and they showed that those who didn't vote in the 20, 2010 general election faced cuts worth 20% of their annual household income compared with 12% of those who did vote. In that way, they argue, unequal turnout unleashes a vicious cycle of disaffection and underrepresentation amongst those groups for which participation is falling and for whom politics seems to have less and less to say to them. That is something I think we all need to take to heart. If we look at local government expenditure, the long-term impact of the council tax freeze, we've debated that in, another, in other debates, but I think go to that social justice issue of the people who vote are most likely to be represented best. We've got to address that, that democratic deficit. We need to make sure that we are open and we are more um, committed to making local elections meaningful and to local politics meaningful. It also is relevant to Scottish really elections. It's, it's an issue across Western democracies. I hope the Minister will accept our amendment. It's promoted in good faith. We think there are some key issues that need to be addressed in addition to the technical issues. Thank you very much. Presiding. Thank you very much. I now call on the Minister to wind up the debate. Um, Minister, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I say at the outset, this has been, I think, a very constructive and well-informed and helpful debate in taking forward that work. Uh, the Government do uh, intend to accept and support the uh, Labour amendment. And I also like Sarah Boyack's description of those who have contributed to the debate and those who are here present. I was going to describe as something of, of political anoraks, but I far prefer the term uh, most enthusiastic members who can contribute uh, to this debate and the ideas uh, going forward. But I think the, the, the tone and the contributions uh, of the, the debate will help uh, fuel that ongoing work. You know, some would ask why we're embarking on this so early for the council elections that are uh, some way away, but the Gould report taught us then we have to put these preparations in in advance. And to have confidence in the electoral system, we should engage uh, first and foremost in a cross-party uh, style uh, with wider stakeholders uh, and then uh, put in place uh, the preparations for, a, for an election that can inspire confidence because of the transparency and the preparations that have been made. So we've very much learned the lessons of previous elections. I'm very mindful of the Local Government Regeneration Committee's uh, work that have helped uh, bring us to this point uh, as well. In terms of some specific questions that were specifically uh, raised, uh, there will now be a new uh, online registration process that will be quicker, uh, convenient uh, and more secure, and I think that that will be welcomed. Another technical point was raised uh, around rejected postal votes, and for the first time, 
we will write, or the electoral authorities will write to those who had their postal votes rejected, explaining why that was the case. And I think that's also very welcome that people are made uh, aware of this uh, going uh, forward, and that will be the case for future elections as well. I think uh, Sarah Boyack and other members covered very pertinent issues about uh, areas, geographic areas, uh, uh, social class it may well be an issue. I'm very mindful when we move from door-to-door -door registration to a different process. Uh, many thousands of people were taken off the register and that has had an impact and there is no doubt that uh, I think how well off areas are and how well off individuals are seems to be a, a factor uh, there. So we need to make it easier to, to register and as Mark Macdonald says uh, to, to stay on the register uh, as well and there's much work uh, around that. Continuing with uh, probity and uh, security is important, but also remove that mystique from the polling place. I remember a time when there was a police officer outside every polling place. There may not have been disabled access. And even just at the European elections there, someone asked me, do I need my passport uh, to vote? So there is an issue about awareness and uh, the ability and how easy it is to actually vote, but not necessarily highlight, as maybe Mark Macdonald did, how easy it is to commit personation by walking in and being... Uh, pretending to be uh, someone else, but there is absolutely uh, something in, in raising the awareness of how easy it is to cast your vote. In terms of young people, we'll engage further uh, with young Scott uh, and others in an event in the SEC. It might not be as popular as the uh, major attractions that normally attend there, but it will be important to engage with young people to take forward that strand of work, uh, as well as other areas uh, around gender, because we have said we agree that councils and other uh, uh, places of decision-making should more uh, accurately represent and reflect the communities that they have to, to govern, making the, uh, the governors more closer uh, to, the, to the governed. Now, there is a duty for uh, parties to, to recruit more uh, women to stand and, and put them up as candidates in elections as well. But back to, to voting, this is much wider than just the administration eh, of voting. John Mason very helpfully covered issues eh, of, of convenience. Eh, Cameron Buchanan, I'm sure, will welcome the Electoral Reform Society, are on the stakeholder group, contributing to this ongoing debate where you raised a, a number of issues. Eh, we do believe eh, that eh, STV has, eh, by uh, proportional uh, representation, uh, stimulated better representation in, in local government, but it does come with challenges as well. We, we don't support compulsory uh, voting uh, for the same reasons uh, you've given um, also. So it's bigger than the administration and the bureaucratic issues, but they have to be addressed uh, going forward. And we'll consider that good practice and continue to um, consult. Uh, Tavish Scott very helpfully covered issues of empowering local communities and financial accountability um, as well and rebalancing power. And I think, for example, the work that we have undertaken around the uh, island areas ministerial working group will be a trailblazer, will actually help that uh, agenda of the rebalancing uh, of power and I think will be uh, warmly welcomed, focusing uh, on what we, what we can uh, do. I also appreciated the comment, incidentally, on the relatively youthful minister, because I get that rest frequently as the years uh, go on. Um, uh, Richard Lyle covered his election in 1976. I wasn't born yet, uh, but I appreciate the contributions on how uh, electoral, electoral... I know it was a Lobro presiding officer, but I uh, appreciated his commentary on how systems have... Uh, improved Excuse over me, the years Minister, there are far too many conversations going on, particularly at the back of the room. Could members resume their seats? Minister? There's far too much consensus on how we conduct elections in this chamber, uh, presiding officer, far too much consensus, and that's to be uh, welcomed. John Wilson helpfully pointed out a number of recommendations from the Local Government Regeneration Committee that the government's been able to take forward, some of which uh, have identified and I'm sure it's not out of personal interest that Mr Wilson has also mentioned the ordering of uh, ballot papers, of course. I'm sure, along with many colleagues, I welcome the announcement the Minister has made today. Would it be possible for you to actually put all those announcements together into one package so that we can disseminate that information across our connections and networks? Minister. Yes, of course, I'm happy to do that, to update the Local Government Regeneration Committee as we continue this process 
uh, of engagement and consultation. So what we've already committed to and what we'll continue to do. So we'll look at the ordering of ballot papers and the question of randomisation uh, as well. I thought Anne McTaggart's contribution was helpful. wouldn't agree with much of the uh, points around finance and budget settlement, but absolutely correct on questions of turnout and encouraging more women to, to participate in becoming candidates uh, as well. Mark Macdonald made a very uh, helpful point and intervention, pointing out that in Aberdeen City Council, put aside the issue, but in the referendum, which was an all-postal ballot, the turnout was 52%. And for the local government elections, electing those people who would actually make the decision, the turnout was not 52%, but 33.7%, which does make the point around alternative voting methods that there's found so much consensus that we welcome uh, in the chamber uh, today. In terms of Kevin uh, Stewart, uh, has covered votes for 16 and 17-year-olds, and there was much consensus to our surprise across the chamber that uh, all parties have supported votes for 16 and 17 year olds, not just in the referendum, but for every election in Scotland. And I think that will be welcomed by 16 and 17 year olds across Scotland, that that is where the uh, spokespeople now are. I know Cameron Buchanan might have some explaining to do to the Conservative <laughs> Party, but we welcome that conversion of the opposition spokesperson. I think you'll need to explain to the Whips later, Mr Buchanan, <laughs> with uh, 40 seconds uh, left. But in essence, uh, presiding officer, there is uh, increased confidence in new methods and different methods of voting, and I think we have to consider them very uh, closely and carefully as we look at improving participation in our democracy and in elections beyond the issues of just turnout, to inspire people to vote so that they've got confidence in the electoral systems and that we can ensure that we've got a healthy, thriving democracy that builds on the momentum on whichever side of the referendum that you stand, but it builds on the momentum that we have right now in engaging with the people of Scotland in Scotland's electoral future. Thank you. That concludes the debate on local government elections delivering improvements in participation and administration. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10272 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10272. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I am now putting the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10272, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureaus. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 10270 and 10271 on approval of SSIs. Moved. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment number 10262.2 in the name of Sarah Boyack, which seeks to amend motion number 10262 in the name of Derek Mackay on local government elections be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10262 in the name of Derek Mackay as amended on local government elections be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10270 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10271 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.